recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues for another day in the legislature, another beautiful day out there. I begin uh, my greetings with, uh, I think, just some, some gratitude and, and thanks and congratulations to the Greater Charlottetown Area Chamber of Commerce for the uh, excellence awards uh, held last night uh, at the uh, PEI Convention Center. Uh, there were 300 people in attendance. Uh, many of us uh, from in this legislature were there. Uh, it was all uh, excellently cohorted and, and safe and it was really, really nice to be out and to participate in events like that. We haven't done it for a very long time. I was incredibly impressed with the list of nominees and winners of the awards. It was uh, uh, really, really grateful that we live in uh, such a place where there's so many innovative and creative and caring islanders uh, in our business sector. Uh, in particular, Liam and Kim Dolan were, are, were recognized as Entrepreneurs of the Year, and Jennifer Evans as Volunteer of the Year, and it was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful evening. Uh, I want to congratulate Colin Yonker, the President, and uh, Penny Walsh McGuire, all of the staff at the Greater Charlton Area Chamber of Commerce for really pulling off a first-class event. Um, also had the chance uh, this morning to be joined by Dr. Morrison uh, at an event uh, hosted by the Festivals and Events PEI, Mr. Speaker, at the Florence Simmons Hall at Holland College. Uh, Emma McKenzie uh, invited us there to talk to those in the festival and events industry and in the accommodations industry and the performing arts industry just to talk about what the summer can look like as we transition our way through COVID. It was uh, 50 or 60 people in attendance and many more online and uh, it was a great event and uh, just again uh, just recognize how important to our tourism sector but also just how important it is to all of us as islanders to make sure we have these festivals and events in communities large and small across this province. They mean a lot uh, to all of us and I'm looking forward to having these events this summer even if they're modified uh, for this year. I also want to say thank you to, uh, to WestJet, Mr. Speaker, who announced uh, recently that we'll, they'll be restoring flights to the region and to the province. Uh, beginning uh, in May, there'll be 11 flights a week coming to Charlottetown, and that's, uh, that's welcome news, and it's a positive sign of, uh, of, 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 of a positive future and uh, really sh a little shot of confidence into the, to the uh, arms uh, for, for all Islanders, along with the vaccines that we're getting, Mr. Speaker. So that's uh, wonderful news. And, Tough, tough uh, year for everybody and uh, those in the aviation and the airline business have felt it as much as anybody for sure. So good to get those back. And just finally, Mr. Speaker, I know May 1st is still a piece away, but it's nice, it's encouraging, and it's uplifting to see the lobster traps start to appear in people's yards and driveways. And uh, uh, it looks like a really good year uh, so far for the fishery, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not much ice to contend with. The markets seem like they're... Uh, ready for live product from PEI in the region. It's a good sign. When I was in Georgetown on Monday at an event, I drove by my longtime and best friend, Derek Johnson, uh, speaker who you know, yeah. was out putting concrete in his traps. And this is pretty early for Derek to be at this, I must say, so he's really taken advantage of COVID. Uh, he's usually the uh, 29th of April getting the gear out of the burn, but he's, he's yeah. got a head start on it this year, and it was good to see you, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to wish uh, continued good luck to all those who make a living in the fishery. It's such important industry for PEI. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'd like to echo what the Premier just said about the President's Excellence Awards at the Greater Charlottetown Chamber of Commerce dinner last night. It was, uh, it was odd, but it was also lovely to be out in public again uh, and with a, you know, a pretty decent sized crowd there last night and uh, it was all very well organized and uh, I felt you know, completely safe, but it was, just, it, it, was, it, was, it was just an odd experience to be back doing the things that we just took for granted in the before times. And uh, it, it, yeah, the Premier spoke beautifully last night, I appreciated your remarks. And congratulations to all the winners. You know, it, for me, it, it demonstrated the diversity and the quality of the businesses here on our island. You know, we had we had winners, uh, ev everybody from fitness trainers to breweries to the Canadian Medical Health Association to Wendell Taylor's Garage. Like they all they all won prizes, 
and uh, the quality of all the nominees, not just those that won, but uh, clearly demonstrates what a wonderful variety and quality of uh, businesses we have here on Prince Edward Island. So congratulations to the winners and also to the Chamber for organizing such a fantastic event last night and to the, the Delta for, uh, for hosting such a, uh, a you know, it was lovely to be back out again. I can't, I can't say that enough. It was great. Um, also on the theatre front, as the Premier mentioned, you know, there's theatre large and small here on Prince Edward Island and the Festival of Small Halls, which was cancelled completely last year, um, is going to happen this year in some form. It's not going to be a festival of small halls. It's going to be slightly bigger halls or, or maybe larger halls or not quite so tiny halls. I'm not sure what they're calling it, but they're going to use uh, the Georgetown Playhouse and, uh, and so a couple of other venues on Goose River, I believe, which will allow them to put some programming on um, whilst maintaining the physical distancing that we all have to do until we reach the finish line, which uh, feels like it's, it's almost there now. So congratulations to uh, Josh Ellis and everybody who organizes that Small Halls Festival. And I, uh, I really hope that it, it gets back on track this year and then fully up to, to speed next year. Um, on a medium-sized scale of theater, the Young at Heart Theater's 2021 tour, um, Fascinating Maritime Ladies, is, is going to open with a show at the King's Playhouse in Georgetown on March the 27th. Um, Katie McGarry is going to be the special opening act. And this is just a lovely show. It's, uh, it's done um, to enrich the lives of seniors through, uh, through theater and music and social interaction. And this year's show will, will star Nadine Haddad and Kelly Mooney and Catherine O'Brien. Uh, and it's just a lovely thing if you ever have an opportunity to go and see it. They, they put on a beautiful show, and it's for a very good cause. And then the biggest theatre, of course, on, on the island, uh, as, as the Premier mentioned, is the Charlottetown Festival. And uh, although, again, it's not going to be as we uh, had hoped it would be this year, it's going to be, at least it's going to happen. Uh, last year brought an end to the 55-year Guinness World record running of uh, Anne of Green Gables, sadly, but um, maybe we'll see that back this year. Um, Adam was a little bit, uh, Adam Brazier was a little bit hesitant in his comments, but I loved something else he said. He said, this is allowing us to rethink the way we work, which is really making lemonade out of lemons, you know. The, I, I really like the, the way that he looked at that. So uh, the arts and culture sector has been really hammered uh, by COVID, second only to the airline industry, and as the Premier said, I'm so happy to welcome regular flights, 11 flights a week, um, between Charlottetown and Toronto for WestJet. And it's a real sign that we're getting back to, you know, what the before times. And uh, I think we, none of us can, uh, can uh, the sooner that happens, the better. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Great to be back again today, and I'd like to say hello to all the residents of Evangeline Musquish, anyone that's watching the proceedings today. Also, I too like to echo the comments of the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition about the Greater Ch Shelltown Chamber of Commerce Awards last night. It was wonderful to see so many people be able to get together in a safe environment, and congratulations to the Chamber and to all the recipients of the awards. And you know, when you hear that WestJet's going to take some flights back into our province, that's wonderful news as well. So things are looking good besides the weather, so that's great. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think she put her hand up. Mr. Speaker, I have good news to share today. The Tyne Valley Rink Rebuild is well on its way. I recently had the pleasure of touring the new facility under construction, and it is truly a sight to see. With the outside structure completed, work is chugging along inside. The floors are in, and some uh, soon the rooms, such as change rooms, canteens, exercise rooms, and more will be in place. Shout out to Cedric Gallant, project manager, and all the construction crew. There is no doubt this new sports and events center will be an incredible addition to Tyne Valley and the surrounding community, and it will be well used and loved by those in the community and beyond, attracting islanders and tourists alike. By the end of March, financial plans will be finalized for this facility. This means the community is now in the final phase uh, of raising its $1 million contribution toward completing the project. This includes things not covered by the federal and provincial funding, such as materials for the canteen and much needed equipment. Raising a million dollars is no small feat at the best of times, and we've come a long way, despite limitations posed by COVID-19. 
All donations, no matter the size, are needed and valued. A donor wall will be constructed within the facility that will recognize all contributions to the campaign. So, when you are at the New Time Valley Rink attending a child's or grandchild's or friend's hockey game, or figure skating competition, or enjoying freshly shucked oysters in the summer at the Oyster Festival, you'll be able to look at the donor wall and see your name and know you were a critical part of making this all possible. It's crunch time, Mr. Speaker, and Time Valley needs all our help to cross the finish line. More important information about the uh, community campaign can be found on the Tyne Valley and Area Events Centre Facebook page or by visiting the Tyne Valley Village office. I'll also be sharing links to the campaign on my social media pages as well as some recent video and pictures from inside the building. Thank you to all of those who have already donated and to the rink board, organizers and community members who have worked so hard to make the new Tyne Valley Rink a reality. This would never have been possible without you and we're almost there. It's time to get this done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this, morning, this afternoon, sorry, I rise to uh, offer condolences to the, uh, the family of, of the federal court judge, Jack O'Keefe, from Charlottetown, Mr. Speaker. I want to pass on uh, our de deepest uh, condolences to the, that family. And uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, today I'm wearing a green tie, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it, well, I didn't have too many to choose from, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, <laughs> um, but Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm wearing it for my uh, my buddy, three-year-old John Robert Bain, Mr. Speaker. Today, uh, March 25th is Cerebral Policy Day, Mr. Speaker, and March is Cerebral Policy Awareness Month. Cerebral Policy is the most common childhood disability, Mr. Speaker. Yet around the globe, there is a broad lack of knowledge of what it is and how it's caused, or even the medical field, Mr. Speaker. In addition, many children and adults with Cerebral Policy are at increased risk of abuse, neglect, and some parts of the world even murder, Mr. Speaker as communities fail to offer people with CP the love and quality of life. Throughout the world, Mr. Speaker, CP Day can build awareness of what CP is and how it's caused and how early detection and intervention is key to improving the outcome for people with CP. So uh, to little John Robert Bain and his parents, Taylor and Craig, I, I wish you a, a good day and all the best. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also had the pleasure to attend the Charlottetown Chamber of Commerce event last night. I was particularly impressed with the amount of people they managed to squeeze in there, uh, 300 people in cohorts, and uh, of course you need a good-sized room, but uh, I think we need more events like that where the planner and uh, I assume that CPHO was involved to work together to work something out that's completely safe. Uh, a lot better alternative than cancelling, in my opinion. Of course, congratulate every one of the winners as well as, as the runner ups and all the employees that are critical to the success of any business. The range and quality of island business is truly inspiring. Uh, beer drinkers can rejoice. Uh, by far the dominant business theme uh, involved drinking beer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, most certainly a pleasure to rise today. I'd like to extend my greetings to all of the good people of District 9, Charlottetown Hillsborough Park. And also today, Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize the incredibly wonderful staff at our public library services. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what I do, our family would do without our libraries. Um, honestly, during my maternity leave, um, I spent more countless hours uh, between the Stratford Library and the Charlottetown Library. I uh, reflect on those times with uh, great fondness and appreciation for our, the wonderful staff in there that always made our family feel so welcome. Mr. Speaker, there's 25 libraries across Prince Edward Island, Island offering books, DVDs, light therapy lamps, snowshoes, telescopes, autism kits, crafts, musical instruments, you name it, Mr. Speaker. 
Through the pandemic, they have adopted to offering a pickup service and are still supporting programming in innovative ways. They have virtual children's story times and have started a book delivery service to early year centers. They also offer quiet study spaces for post-secondary students to complete their online post-secondary schooling. These new pandemic style programs are on top of the amazing work uh, they do with our community care book delivery service, talking book home service, and EAL and adult literacy tutoring. Mr. Speaker, did you know, just recently, they launched a music and memory service that offers music on MP3 players available to persons with memory loss. And we have eliminated late fees to reduce barriers and ensure everyone has the opportunity to have a lifelong relationship with reading and learning. I also want to give a shout out to the staff at our public library headquarters in Morrell who process every piece of library material for both our public libraries and school libraries. Mr. Speaker, construction of the new Charlottetown Library is coming along well, and when complete this fall, it will be an amazing centerpiece of our community. So to the approximately 60 staff who work within our public library service, I thank you for all that you do for all islanders. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all islanders to check out their local library, and if you don't have a library card, you can apply for one quickly and easily, online quickly and easily. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've, it's a pleasure to rise this morning, or this afternoon. It feels like morning all the time when we walk in here. Anyway, hi to everybody at Mermaid Stratford that's watching. And I would just like to give a shout out to two businesses within my district that um, were fortunate enough to be um, recipients of the awards, and that would be Pam and Steve Collette of Third Degree Training, as well as Jeff Ford, who owns Wendell, T Wendell Taylor Garage, and both amazing businesses within my district. And I just wanted to say congratulations to you guys. Also, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to mention Amber, uh, Amber Jadis. So Amber owns Steam PEI. And what Amber has done is she's gone out and she's obtained funding um, to really engage young girls, in, well, young and youth girls, in the love of STEAM. And so she received federal funding, and she's now um, reached out to the Girl Guides of Prince Edward Island and is working with the units to bring the joy of um, engineering to all of the girls. And I just think it's a fantastic idea, and I'm so happy that she applied for that. Uh, grant to be able to work with the girls of girl the girl guides of Prince Edward Island. So, thank you to her, and look forward to taking part in that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A pleasure to rise, and of course, welcome all those watching from District 18, Rustico Emerald. And, Mr. Speaker, this week I was uh, was able to finally get out after almost a year and uh, do a tour of, of Lennon House, Lennon Recovery House, which of course is in Rustico, and just see the great work and the great strides that they've made even over the last year during the pandemic. They're, they're now housing 23 uh, individuals. They have both men and women, and they've got all the systems in place. And they've already had five people who've come out of their program, and uh, they're just do, doing fantastic things. So a big shout out to uh, Steve Guy, who's the, one of the directors there, and uh, Diane Young, and Ronnie Nicholson, who's the chair of the board. But also, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to rise today, and I wanted to congratulate, uh, congratulate myoldapartment.org. Darcy Lanthier uh, is one who started that. They've got a, uh, a crowdsourced uh, registry of rents that tenants have paid for rental apartments and PEI. And this is fantastic, Mr. Speaker. It's so great, great to see the community uh, moving forward with this. And, and as they say on the, the site, tenants can pay it forward by documenting their rent here, and future tenants can then use that information to make sure they're being charged a legal rent. And uh, yes, you know, Mr. Speaker, we have a complaints-based system on PEI when it comes to that. And this, this sort of tool should uh, really help people. So kudos to them. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Brighton. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And like my colleagues had talked about before, it was great to be out last night at the President's Excellence Award for the Chamber of Commerce. And, and I just want to say uh, a shout out to District 14 residents, uh, Kim and Liam Dolan, and Mark and Sinead, too. And, and you know, the, the, Liam and Kim, their story is incredibly inspiring. And, and he went through it, and uh, everybody that was there saw the pictures of what the collateral room was like uh, once upon a time and, and where that where they've taken it and uh, you know they're, they're, they're quite an inspiration so congratulations well deserved and as well as uh, uh, third degree fitness uh, friends of mine Steve and Pam Collette 
who've done an incredible job with wellness and connecting the business world, and I was I was just so thrilled about them. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the minister talked about Jack O'Keefe, and I wanted to, to recognize the family there, Jacqueline and, and Renee, and and uh, and some of the family members there. That's that's incredibly, incredibly difficult times. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? No, I remember statements. I'll call on the honourable me member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the last several days, I've watched the health minister struggle to articulate clear direction on how, or a clear direction out of a general health crisis that is clearly getting out of control here in Prince Edward Island. I've watched the minister contradict statements made by his department. I've seen the minister at odds with claims made by the premier, and perhaps worst of all. I've heard the minister twist his own words into pretzels, so that there is very little sense of a credible path through the health care crisis that Islanders now face. Quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, this is becoming a real concern in rural PEI, and in particular, West Prince. For many years, under the Bins government, we knew that rural health care was under attack. From a party that was preoccupied with health centralization and a willful disregard for Western Prince Edward Island. So when we hear about health hubs, or neighborhoods, or homes, or whatever the buzzword of the day has been chosen, we get concerned. For many years, there's been a sense of peace around long-term future of Western and community hospitals. And the people of West Prince are very protective of that peace. But now I'm beginning to hear concerns again. We know that the minister was an advocate in favor of closing Western and community hospitals. And we know that he was part of the Bins Roadshow back in the day, <laughs> trying to persuade the people of West Prince that they would be better off without a hospital in O'Leary and in Alberton. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I've heard those wor worries, and I have tried to reassure residents that this will not happen. But when I heard the minister attack the record of the former government, which was fully supportive of two Western hospitals, then I began to worry as well. Back in the day, the current minister told people he was certain that the closure of those two hospitals was the right direction to take. And with the lack of focus and direction that I'm currently hear, uh, hearing, I am concerned, Mr. Speaker, that once again, the minister will go back to his former position. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I was struck by the That's information in the Auditor the General's 2020, 2021 annual report. The chapter on surveying the boards, agencies, and commissions revealed very concerning gaps in our governance model. Many respondents reported not having or unsure of having basic safeguards to ensure good governance. Lack of training, a strategic plan, that sounds familiar, Mr. Speaker. I've asked the departments in this House and the ministers for strategic plans, and I haven't received any yet. Um, a, they've noted lack of audit committees, lack of clear and measurable goals, lack of performance evaluation, and the list goes on. Mr. Speaker, these are fundamental steps to ensure good government governance. You cannot achieve transparency, good stewardship, accountability, good leadership, or integrity if key safeguards are not in place. Our agencies, boards, and commissions manage almost, almost as much as of our island's assets as the provincial, provincial government itself. When these key safeguards are not in place, we open ourselves up for fraud, corruption, or conflict of interest. Have we not learned anything? PEI has some real black marks in its recent performance history. I am most surprised by the lack of requirement of a conflict of interest dis a disclosure upon appointment, and it's something that should be done annually. As MLAs, we disclose annually, and rightfully so. This allows us to be held accountable and allows the public to do the same for us. A conflict of interest exists when an individual or corporation has the opportunity, real or perceived, to exploit their position for personal or corporate benefit. Corruption occurs when the individual or corporation takes advantage of an opportunity and indeed abuses their position for private gain. Mr. Speaker, have we learned nothing? When it comes to conflicts of interest, appearance is as important as reality. This is why disclosing conf conflicts of interest is important. 
This government promised that when they were in government, they would do politics differently. From this side of the floor, Mr. Speaker, it looks like much the same. Thank you. End of member statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taking as notice. No? For first question, I'll call upon the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Minister of Health and Wellness, when speaking about the mobile mental health units, stated that police may be involved, and he stressed may in that sentence. Since 2015, U.S. police have shot and killed 1,400 American citizens whilst responding to mental health crisis calls. However, in Denver, Colorado, the equivalent of our mobile mental health units, they call them support team assistant response units, or STAR units, which involve a nurse and a social worker, not a policeman. In the last six months, they've responded to 748 calls. No police again. Nobody was shot, nobody was killed, nobody was even arrested. A question to the Premier. Why are we continuing to even consider including police officers in these teams when other jurisdictions are abandoning this model and the evidence clearly shows that it's a bad idea? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, as we have been saying for a while in here, what we're trying to do is to find a delicate balance uh, uh, within uh, the delivery of a service, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the primary issues that we're dealing with from health professionals uh, is uh, making sure they have access to a secure and safe work environment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do delicately, I think every case will have to be different, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we do not want to presume that somebody in need of mental health services uh, is uh, uh, guilty of something or is treated like they're some kind of convict, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not at all. What we want to do is make sure that individual or individuals get the service they need uh, as quickly and timely as they can. At the same time, I do have a responsibility to provide those health professionals with a safe work environment. And I think what we're trying to find uh, within this model, Mr. Speaker, is a way that we can do uh, all of that. And I only would suggest, I think what the Minister has been suggesting all along, is that only would we have uh, police services there if it were to be required, Mr. Speaker. We do not wish to, uh, uh, to uh, have somebody there if they don't need to be. Uh, my only goal here, the Minister's only goal, our government's only goal, is to try to give as much quality service to a person in need as fast, as quickly as we can provide it. The Honourable Leader, the official opposition. Thanks. And the Premier says, well, the Minister's been saying all along, the only thing that's been consistent all along is that the Minister has changed his mind almost every day. The, the recent report of the Auditor General did a review of how Crown, Crown corporations are governed. As the AG pointed out, and I quote, poor governance in these organizations could lead to adverse consequences, including financial losses, real or perceived conflicts of interest, as well as loss of confidence in public institutions, end quote. One of the startling things revealed in his report is that less than half of the board members of Crown corporations filed a conflict of interest declaration when they joined their respective boards. And furthermore, only one fifth of them actually completed annual disclosures. A question to the Premier. How important do you feel it is for our public institutions to properly control and mitigate all re real or perceived conflicts of interest? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. I too was uh, uh, disappointed to, to, to read the Auditor General's report. I think it's important uh, that all of those who serve government, be they elected, be they employees, or be the uh, appointments to boards of Crown Corporations, I think there's a responsibility they all have to make sure they're conducting business as professionally as possible. Uh, I would hesitate to suggest that uh, even though the perception could be there that, that we paint everyone with the same brush, that they're doing something untoward. I think all of those individuals who are involved uh, need to follow the proper protocols, do what needs to be done, uh, and I think it would serve them best, Mr. Speaker, if they were to sign these uh, uh, annually, and Mr. Speaker, and we will take the recommendation of the Auditor General, and we will act upon it quickly, Mr. Speaker, and uh, all in the goal of trying to provide the best possible governance for the people of Prince Edward Island. Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, a press release by the Minister of Finance announced $80,000 to test racehorses for strangles. A question to the Minister. 
What was your involvement in the decision to, uh, by the Department of Finance to provide this funding? The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it is a pleasure to rise and address this. If you would like to, Honorable Member, reach out to the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. She will be more than happy to tell you that this was discussed. There is no conflict unless it only benefits me and not the whole industry. The discussion I've had with all the horsemen who've reached out to me, including the people at Red Shores who are concerned about the current impending, we hope, <laughs> season, is that we will not have a race season on PEI. And honorable member, it is very, very disheartening, disappointing that this line of questioning is being put to me because it has been cleared by the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am certainly happy to hear that it has been cleared with the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. Last fall, the Special Committee on Government Record Retention acknowledged def deficiencies in the way government retains records of decisions. Far too often, there are no records created or retained about the decisions made by government. A question to the same minister. What records did your department create and retain regarding its decision to fund the provision of supports to racehorses, and will you table those in the House? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I had mentioned earlier on this questioning, I will be more than happy to table what is, was, uh, what is spent, where the money has gone. We're working with the Atlantic Provinces Harness Racing Commission and with the PEI Harness Racing Commission and with Red Shores to ensure that all horses on PEI are tested for strangles. It's very important to the industry, and we want to ensure that there is an industry going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also agree with you on that. However, what I'm, what I'm concerned about most is we've had a history of uh, past discretions and we're putting supports in place and procedures in place to ensure that those are followed to make sure that those don't happen again. So given the Minister of Finance has ownership shares in a pretty successful racehorse, the public is concerned about the Minister's personal stakes in this. Were you worried about your investments in racehorses or your government's or your department's gambling profits um, and whether they would be compromised? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I cannot believe that I'm up answering questions like this when we have very, very important issues to deal with in this province. I have disclosed to, my, to the Public uh, Conflict of Interest Commissioner that I do have shares in two racehorses, and if the Honourable Member thinks it's successful, she's more than welcome to purchase them from me. <laughs> but I'll also point out this is a very, very serious problem in the harness racing industry. And they, as the minister responsible, I will stand in this house and defend what we are doing for that industry. The industry creates and supports an estimated 750 jobs on this island. They create an estimated $2.2 million worth of provincial tax revenues, create an estimate $3.7 million in federal and municipal tax revenues, and an impact to the GDP of an estimated $31.1 million. And if the honorable member and all of the opposition want to say they support agriculture, they better look at harness racing as part of that industry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A needs analysis on housing in Prince County identified that of the very few options for women in need of emergency shelter, all are operating at or near maximum capacity, with at least one noting that being at capacity means they are turning women away. Question to the Minister of Housing Is that enough information for you to fund a women's shelter in Summerside? The Honorable Member from Social. Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I really do want to thank the member from across for, for raising this issue because it is so important. And, and yes, of course, we do need to support uh, women um, in, in Summerside through women's shelters, especially women who, uh, who need to escape violent situations or are homeless for whatever reason. And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, I think that uh, we'll probably see more information coming in the near future on that. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was great to see the Minister respond so quickly to the needs of the harness racing community in addressing the strangles outbreak. However, as my colleagues have noted, we have seen government drag its feet when it has come to addressing other priorities for islanders. This includes a failure to address a lack of emergency shelter in Summerside, which has been stuck in this bureaucratic gridlock. A question to the Minister of Finance. Why do we need a community needs assessment if we want to keep islanders off the street, but we don't if we want to keep strangles off the race racetrack. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I cannot comment on what happens in the Department of Social Development Housing regarding housing. I will have a statement further to talk about housing on Prince Edward Island. As far as strangles, it's an immediate concern to the industry. We want to be there. It's an immediate concern to the industry that creates jobs in our communities. That it's under my purview. It's under my department. I will continue to work with the harness racing industry as the minister responsible for harness racing to ensure they are supported. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under the Mental Health Act, Islanders can be held involuntarily in PEI hospitals due to mental health conditions. This is sometimes a necessary action to protect individuals in crisis, but it's something that we must be extremely careful with. We are removing a person's right to freedom, and so we have to make sure that we follow a very strict and accurate process. Question to the Minister of Health. Are you aware of how many Islanders are held involuntarily due to mental health conditions each year on PEI, and are you confident that the correct process is being followed? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question. Uh, certainly uh, a very important one. Uh, I do not have the exact numbers, Mr. Speaker, but I will bring them back uh, as soon as possible. I do know that, Mr. Speaker, that we do have uh, the Mental Health Review Board, which is uh, a board that individuals set in uh, the event that they do feel or a loved one feels that they have been uh, wrongly uh, placed uh, with, uh, against their will, that there is that adjudication process for them to back uh, to. But again, Mr. Speaker, I will bring that information back for the member and for the House. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the answer is between 440 to 500 Islanders a year um, are held uh, involuntarily in PEI hospitals due to mental health conditions. One thing that alarmed me, Mr. Speaker, when I was looking at the numbers is that between 2014 and 2016, we had about 250 to 300 people held involuntarily. Then, in 2017, that number suddenly grew to 440. Since then, we've had between 440 and almost 500 Islanders being held involuntarily. Question to the Minister of Health. Does that sudden increase in 2017 concern you? And what changed at that time to cause the increase? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, uh, absolutely, that number does concern me. I am sure, though, that, Mr. Speaker, that uh, there has to be, there certainly should be extremely good rationale for uh, any of uh, these individuals uh, to be placed. Uh, but again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I will certainly look into this further. It is, from my opinion, a high number. But with that, uh, I would uh, certainly uh, uh, hesitate to cast too much uh, of, uh, of an opinion on it before I have the details, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Minister, member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is a, a high number, and it is concerning that this hasn't been flagged as an issue yet. Uh, the responsibility of the administrator, Mr. Speaker, as defined in the Mental Health Act, is also critically important here. An email was shared with our office in which the former Minister of Health stated that Leslie Warren was the administrator since November 2020, but in a FOIP request, we were told that Lisa Thibodeau was the administrator for that same time period. This is another example of the minister and the department not seeing eye to eye. Question to the Minister. The role of the administer, administrator is to protect the rights of individuals who are being held involuntarily. I don't need to tell anybody how important that is. Question, Minister. How can you not know at every moment who that individual is? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the honourable member, with regard to individuals that are being held involuntarily, again, uh, the numbers do concern me, Mr. Speaker, but I'm not going to stand here and say that uh, staff, I'm not going to throw any staff under the bus on anything like, uh, on any matter, Mr. Speaker. I have to have faith in my staff. I have to have faith that they follow the procedures, that they follow the appropriate processes that are in place. And as I had mentioned, Mr. Speaker, we do have the Mental Health Review Board, which is an, uh, an adjudicator, an adjudication board for looking at, uh, at situations if individuals and or family members or loved ones feel that they have been uh, put uh, uh, involuntarily placed, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Donable member from Pine Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm certainly glad you're not going to throw any staff under the bus. I mean, the, uh, the fact that you would even consider that, uh, Minister, it is your responsibility to ensure that the conditions of the Mental Health Act are being met. I want to note that there seems to be nowhere online or in public that states clearly who the administrator is. And the information on the Mental Health Review Board that the Minister has mentioned now several times, um, on the website it hasn't been updated in ages. Uh, the terms of almost all of the board members listed have expired, all but one in fact. Question to the Minister of Health, do you understand the important roles of the administrator and the Mental Health Review Board play in ensuring, ensuring Islanders' rights are respected and why it is critical that Islanders have access to this information? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. I do uh, appreciate and understand the important role of the administrator of the board. Uh, the honorable member states that uh, when she has went online, that the Mental Health Review Board, that uh, terms have expired. Well, Mr. Speaker, I am very pleased to state here today that those uh, board positions, that they have been filled and that information will be updated very shortly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honorable Member from Pine Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good news to hear that will be updated. It is frustrating that it requires me standing in the House asking for that information to be updated for it to happen. Mr. Speaker, as of right now, it's unclear who the administrator is. No one knows who the current members of the Mental Health Review Board are. The minister and this government keep saying that mental health is a priority. Islanders have been asked to trust this government, that they are making mental health a priority. But honestly, Mr. Speaker, it's unclear if even the minimum standards set out in the Mental Health Act are being met. Question to the Minister of Health. You are responsible for the legislation within your department, and you are responsible to ensure that it is being followed. What are you doing to ensure that the Mental Health Act is being followed to a T for all Islanders? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, numerous acts right across the province, and each one of those acts fall under the responsibility of a uh, given ministry. And yes, we collectively here in this side of uh, the House, we take responsibility for ensuring that those acts are adhered to and that they are uh, uh, administered, if you like, Mr. Speaker, in an appropriate way. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, that we also have boards, such as the Mental Health Review Board, that if an individual feels that their rights that uh, have been uh, uh, violated, if you like, Mr. Speaker, under any of these acts, they do have that option to take it uh, to an adjudication process. And Mr. Speaker, just uh, very briefly in closing, I would have to say that it is not the honorable member standing here in the House that's resulted in the, uh, uh, filling uh, reappointment appointments of ones to the Mental Health Review Board. It is not her standing over there that has brought that about. It has been the initiative of this government moving forward and that they will be updated on the website very shortly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, I asked whether municipalities were able to implement inclusionary zoning policies and bylaws, which are used in other jurisdictions to increase the supply of affordable housing in communities. The Minister of Fisheries and Communities told the House that municipalities do not have this power, and changes to legislation would be required before municipalities could in introduce inclusionary zoning. Question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. 
It's been nearly a year since we asked, when will the province make the necessary changes to permit inclusionary zoning? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That actually falls on the Minister of uh, Lands and Environment, or pardon me, the Agricultural Land. However, our department is working with their department on special planning areas and the land matters also. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. The City of Charlottetown refuses to have any public meetings to regulate short-term rentals, despite having a technology to host them and despite having held other public meetings during the pandemic. In fact, we've been waiting over a year since the recommendations of the report and assessment on short-term rentals. A question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. How do you define your role in ensuring the residents of Charlottetown have the same rights as all other islanders to express their views on important issues? Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, one must understand what the actual role of the MGA is, the Municipal Governments Act, and that is to ensure that municipalities have the proper governance in place to deal with municipal affairs. Matters that the, the, uh, the Honourable Member is asking about actually falls under the Department of Lands and Agriculture and Land. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, if there's any consistency, it's that it's never somebody's fault, it's always somebody else's. The province and the city have both clearly stated <coughs> that short-term rentals have a significant impact on the housing market. The current zoning and development bylaw in Charlottetown does not permit commercial short-term rentals. Clearly, this bylaw is not and has never been enforced. Question for the same minister. What's the accountability for a municipality that won't enforce its own bylaws? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the Municipal Governments Act, it, it's very clear in what its mandate is and how it governs uh, the municipalities across the island, all 59 of them. And our department works with the Department of Agriculture and Land to ensure that zoning and them type of laws are, are, are adhered to by our municipalities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my questions are directed at the Minister of Health, and I'll try to be as specific as possible, Mr. Speaker. So my question without a preamble today, because I think we've had enough of that the last three days, is why is your department sending contradictory messages within 24 hours apart? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I can only uh, uh, try to uh, get my head around just what uh, the Honourable Member may be coming at as far as contradictory messaging. I would assume that uh, uh, given his uh, tone and lack of a preamble, that he is referring to uh, the mobile mental health response teams, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly if he's referring to something different, I would be happy to, uh, to elaborate on, on another matter further. But uh, Mr. Speaker, I do not feel that we have been giving contradictory messaging on this. We have said right from the first that it's about Islanders. It's about delivering a service for Islanders. This has been an initiative that has been taken place over three successive administrations, Mr. Speaker, and that in and of itself shows the importance of it. And I do give, as I did give uh, yesterday, credit to former administrations for the initiation of this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall, Meadowbanks. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I'll give him a preamble. <laughs> <laughs> and it is confusing. The media is confused, the unions are confused, the frontline staff care workers are confused. Everybody's confused, Minister. And obviously, everybody's spinning. Uh, we first heard that Health PEI was going to manage the last two, for the last two weeks, and we were told MetaV would operate and manage recently. And now we're being told the Department of Health and Wellness will manage them back again. Minister, there's been no consultation, no contract signed, no MOU signed, and as recent as this morning, the nurses' union are, may, are doing publications in regards to uh, their concerns. Minister, how can we effectively deal with mental health when we're in a situation like we are today due to miscommunication, if that's what it is, due to different messages being delivered to the general Question. public? <laughs> Minister, what are you going to do to change this? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the preamble because it reinforced uh, my assumption uh, 
as to uh, where uh, the honorable member was coming from in his first question. But certainly, Mr. Speaker, we are working with unions. We are working with staff. We are working with leadership. This has been, as I had said before, Mr. Speaker, an extremely important initiative over three different administrations. Mr. Speaker, we are going to get it done. We are going to get it done by working with our partners, and we are going to get it done by working with our staff. Uh, it's just too important of an initiative, Mr. Speaker, to <coughs> let's go by the wayside. Uh, it has to be about Islanders. We'll continue to be about Islanders, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadow Banks, your second supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister reads The Guardian and I know he listens to CBC and I don't have to say much more to uh, add to the conversation about how confusing this has been and the, and the mismanagement of this whole whole process has been unrelevant and it's, uh, you know, last night we have the Canadian Mental Health uh, receiving an award for the Chamber. I mean, uh, they, have they been consulted? So there's all kinds of things that is wrong with this whole situation. The minister continued adding to growing list of confusion when he announced model change yesterday. While many have called for this change in relevance to law enforcement, has the minister considered the amount of time and resources preparing officers in training for this new role? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you again, and uh, I'd alluded to before, but this has been three administrations, and, uh, you know, the previous administrations, collaboration working, were they able to get it done? Unfortunately, they were not. We are going to. But with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to stress that the model, that the delivery of the program, as I've said before and when we'll continue to say, it is managed by health and wellness, that it will be delivered by staff from Health PEI, and that we are going to continue to work with our great partners. And when I say our great partners, our uh, paramedics under Medivy, Island EMS, and earlier uh, in question period here today, the Premier himself very appropriately and eloquently indicated when and why law enforcement would be involved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Obviously, that's the third same answer, Mr. Speaker, but I, I give him kudos for sticking to his guns. We're now being told that all police officers won't be embedded within the teams, but that they will play a role when necessary. During a committee meeting on this topic, your own officials, indicated that there would be a partnership in place with law enforcement. With their role might be decreasing, law enforcement still will be involved and will still need to be compensated. How much do you expect to pay now for this partnership and will the cost be modified by the recent change in model that no one seems to know about? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, from my perspective as Minister, and I'm sure from this side of the House, cost when it comes to getting this up and getting it off the ground is not a factor. The honorable member stated himself, partnerships, he used that word. That is what we are working with here, Mr. Speaker. And again, I don't know how many times I have to say this, but I'm going to say it one more anyway, that it is, it is an initiative that is managed by health and wellness, staffed by staff members, trained staff members, nurses, social workers from Health PEI and working with our partners. And at the end of the day, what's it all about? It's all about delivering a service, a much needed service to the people of Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. It's not hard to tell that money is not a factor. When you put pe move employees from one to a private company without a contract, Without any discussion or negotiation with unions, money's not. A, and I'm sure Medivy's watching here today, and they're saying, okay, boys, add a couple zeros to that check. Yeah, yeah. That's what's going to happen. Early on in the pandemic, this government ejected patients from transition unit at Mount Herbert, and then they emptied unit nine at QEH. Yeah. However, when it became clear that additional space wasn't required during due to COVID, government didn't fully reopen the service. Instead, they used the area for other purposes. Question to the Minister of Health. How many beds in Unit 9 are currently available to those seeking mental health treatment, and how many beds are still being used for other purposes? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate where the member is coming from. Certainly, uh, we've uh, heard reference uh, in this session in previous ones with regard to psychiatric urgent care uh, clinics, uh, you know, but we have to look. It's so unfortunate from my perspective, Mr. Speaker, that as we move forward on initiatives, very important initiatives for the people of Prince Edward Island, that the great work of our staff by times does get overlooked. And when I look at that, we look at the initiatives that we're moving forward on, whether it is the mobile crisis response, whether it's a single point of access, whether it's the uh, mental health and addictions uh, uh, campus. And I would like to point out too, Mr. Speaker, that although the mental health and addictions campus has been up uh, on the radar for some time, it's us that have shovels in the ground now. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Metal Banks for second supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to be serious because I think mental health deserves a serious note. But some of these answers, some of these answers are purely political, and I think uh, we've already heard from uh, uh, the government on how, where we want to take this and how we want to stay focused on mental health because it is an issue. And you know what? Honourable Member, uh, Minister, some of these questions are coming to me from your staff. So when you say you're supporting your staff, there's communication barrier there as well. So, and you've also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, shovels in the ground, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, we've already dealt with that issue many times, and it is good to see some progress in that, Mr. Speaker. And I, I can't wait to see it up and running. Because Question it was member. This, this former government that started it, but it's taken two years. How are, you've talked about you mentioned the new 24-7 phone line and mental health access. How are two programs that currently don't exist supposed to help Islanders experiencing a crisis today? Donovan, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do give uh, credit to the former administration uh, for the initiatives that, uh, that they had started and that we are able to move forward on. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member did mention uh, in his previous question with regard to Unit 9. And uh, at this point in time, Mr. Speaker, there are seven bids for inpatient mental health at Unit 9, and that will be moving to 12 bids uh, shortly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think, too, that uh, you look at uh, the initiatives that we've talked about here, whether it's single point of access, whether it's uh, mobile response units. Uh, yes, uh, I would, uh, I'm sure everybody in this legislature would have liked to have seen those up, whether it was at the start of our administration or the previous administration. But it does take time, Mr. Speaker. We will work with our partners, and we will get it done, and we'll get it done right, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmero, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. Back in 2006, you were one of the leads in the attempt to close the hospitals in O'Leary and in Alberton. In fact, Minister, you were the chair of the consultation committee on replacing the two hospitals in Western uh, PEI with a replacement in Bloomfield. The committee released a report supporting closure in June of 2006, which I will table later. Minister, what was your role in 2006 as chair of that committee regarding the recommended closure of the two hospitals? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do appreciate the, the Honourable Member bringing this forward. Uh, it was, and he just used the word consultation. And that is one exactly what it was. I think, Mr. Speaker, it'll be interesting, too, when the honorable member does table the report to see the individuals, other than myself, who sat on that committee. We had Dr. Herb Dickerson, who was the first NDP MLA in this house, certainly very well respected in West Prince. We had Dr. Sethi. We had the two nurse managers from both Community Hospital and from Western Hospital, Mr. Speaker. That report, we had a consultation in communities right throughout West Prince. And at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, there were no minority opinions in the report that was tabled. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignesh, Palmerow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all know the Conservatives under Pat Binns were concentrated on closing the two hospitals in the West. The decision concerned a lot of people up West. 
And to this day, I hear from residents of West Prince who are very concerned that this government may try to do the same thing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, why did the minister support that proposal of health care centralization in 2006? The Honourable Member of yeah. Minister of Health and Wellness. I can, I can, re I can respond to that. It's interesting. It's interesting, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we hear this line of questioning from, from the Honourable Member, who was part of an administration that was trying to close rural schools. That's very interesting. We are not, I am committed to Western Hospital. I am committed to the delivery of health care services right across this province, Mr. Speaker. And it's so unfortunate that, uh, that the honorable member is trying to uh, put, uh, you know, is this a fear factor game that we're playing? No, it's not. This is about delivering services for the people of PEI and certainly the great people in West Prince and the great people in District 26, Albert and Bloomfield. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, your second supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's interesting to see him standing up for the people of West when he wanted to close two hospitals in West Prince and one in his own very district. Yeah, the schools actually, you know, we'll talk about the schools. They weren't closed. They weren't closed at all. So there you go. Yep. The hospitals aren't closed. Okay, members. Are the hospitals closed? Mr. Speaker, yeah, I remember being I remember being part of We the West, and I don't remember seeing that member anywhere as near those meetings. So, Mr. Speaker, back in 2006, the minister must have had a very clear reason in his mind why the closure of the two hospitals were needed. So, was the minister following his own beliefs, or was someone else calling the shots? And if so, who? General Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure uh, we're prepared to the honourable member's uh, comments with, uh, on We the West. I will tell you around. this, Mr. Speaker, every meeting that was held with regard to the school closures, whether we're talking it was hospitals. in West Prince, talking whether it was in talking Charlottetown area, I attended the them. Hospital you tried to close. <laughs> but talking about the hospital you tried to close. That's what honourable you tried members, to the minister has the floor. Yeah. Okay. Let's cut to the chase here. I did not, I did not try to close. I was in, sitting on as a chair of a committee that was receiving input, collaborating with the people of West Prince. Subsequent administrations did uh, have some trouble keeping those hospitals open. I believe, uh, you know, you look back that there, at one point, there were three H's when we headed west from Summerside. How many are there now? There's one H. And who took those two other H's off? It was not this administration, Mr. Speaker. It was not this one. Not but I will stand here and I will commit, Mr. Speaker, that the H With that's up there now in West Prince will stay up in West Prince. Yeah. 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 The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, news of the Atlantic bubble being resumed next month did come as welcome news to many uh, when it was announced last weekend, uh, last week rather, parents being able to see their kids, grandparents being able to uh, hug and kiss and see those uh, grandchildren that they've missed so long. Now currently, Mr. Speaker, the primary access point to the mainland is through the Confederation Bridge, and the reopening of the Atlantic bubble will certainly increase the traffic there. Now last summer, when the Atlantic bubble did open, uh, there were multiple border access points. There were still some delays, which is totally understandable. Question to the Minister of Justice and Public Safety. What changes will need to be made in order for the boarding screening measures for Islanders to not have to expect large wait times when, in fact, the Atlantic bubble does open? Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, of course, uh, the role of justice and public safety isn't actually, uh, we, CPHO is uh, in, in charge of the uh, entry point right now, but the Minister of Health has been on his feet for a lot this afternoon, so I'll, I'll take this one, give him a little break, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are well aware of the situation that, uh, the excitement of the new bubble that's uh, going to open up again, and uh, 
working with uh, highway safety there at the bridge now, as, as well as the health officers doing the screening, Mr. Speaker. We are approving uh, the applications now for the people that uh, are uh, planning to come. And as of, since the bubble closed last time, there's almost been 12,000 applications to come to this island. So we're anticipating a, a large amount of uh, influx, but uh, I can tell you our staff is working to get the, the approvals done in a timely matter. Highway safety is working, and uh, the health officers are ready. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Ball, member from Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good to hear that uh, the uh, department is ready for the influx. Um, this is kind of more for the outflux. Um, you know, Islanders have been patient. Um, they have waited a long time to see their families, and maybe they have friends and relatives outside of the province. Uh, we wouldn't want them to wait any longer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we uh, heard in the news that Northumberland Ferries services uh, to Nova Scotia is expected to begin their season at the start of the month. It does always uh, create a bit of excitement and some economic activity for Eastern PEI. I know growing up there, it was a very exciting time when the, the ferry would resume service. Now, of course, with that excitement, there is a little bit of trepidation. A uh, question of the same minister. Uh, what sort of border screening measures will be put in place at Wood Islands this year to support the safe operation of the ferry to Nova Scotia? Honourable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a very good question, and uh, we we can't wait uh, for May 1st to come uh, for the opening of the uh, ferry. It does uh, add uh, extra uh, entry point to this island, and very crucial for that end of the island for sure. But I have to uh, make sure everyone is aware that if you're an Atlantic resident, all you need is ID to to move within the bubble. So that we don't anticipate the the lineups to be. Too bad, but if it's if you're from outside the bubble, yeah, you're going to. Uh, it's not going to be as easy. You have to do the application forms and and get approval. And uh, but when the bubble opens, we will be ready, and I can't wait for it to happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member from Charlottetown, Winslow, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, that is great news uh, for the people that have been very patient and that may want to uh, either come to Prince Edward Island or uh, leave our beautiful province. Uh, yesterday, there was more good news. It was mentioned in the opening remarks this more uh, this more uh, this afternoon, rather, with the WestJet flights returning to the Charlottetown Airport on June 24th. Uh, of course, 11 flights weekly between Toronto and Charlottetown, which is great news for island tourism operators. Question of the same minister. In the budget, there was a $1 million uh, dedication to the Charlottetown Airport Authority through the Air Access Recovery Program. And that was to support safe relaunch of air travel services at the Charlottetown Airport. Will any of these funds be used to support border screening measures at the airport? The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honorable Member, for the question. Uh, so, no, that million dollars uh, was to rebuild our air industry here. It's a partnership with the province, Charlottetown Airport, and ACOA. Uh, so they'll be working uh, to develop that plan, and uh, once we have a bit of an update what that looks like, we'll certainly take it back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The federal government, through CMHC, has launched the, launched the Rapid Housing Initiative last year to expedite the delivery of affordable housing. We all know that affordable housing is desperately needed in PEI. A question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. What PEI proposals were submitted to CMHC? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And when it came to the Rapid Housing Initiative by the federal government, it was, it was something that the department uh, carefully considered and, and partnered with uh, two community organizations to, uh, to, to put in some proposals. And as the member uh, across may know, we haven't heard uh, the results back from the federal government yet. And uh, in the department, I know as minister, I'm, I'm waiting to hear back exactly what the results of that uh, Rapid Housing Initiative funding are going to be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. In other jurisdictions, the Rapid Housing Initiative Fund has been used by governments to buy existing properties that provide immediate solutions to priority needs, a motel, for example, to house homeless and housing insecure individuals. Were any government-led projects submitted to the Rapid Housing Initiative Fund by this government? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, um, uh, as, as the member across knows, uh, these, these are the, exactly the sort of things that, that we consider and we look at, and, and we're looking at trying to uh, um, expand housing as quickly as we can, whether that be by uh, 
purchasing existing properties or, or, or building. And um, so that's what we're going to continue to do. And uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I look forward to uh, perhaps uh, sharing some, some of the initiatives that we're going to work on uh, in, in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll take that as a no, which is unfortunate because the deadline was December 31, so we've missed it. Seven provinces have signed on to the Canada Housing Benefit so far. Money is already flowing to Ontario, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan and British Columbia. When will our province begin administering the CMHC Canada Housing Benefit? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I'll share that information as soon as it's uh, available to me. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we work we work closely closely with CMHC, and, and we're going to take advantage of, of that money. We're going to spend it wisely. We're going to make sure that we uh, we help provide housing for the uh, for islanders uh, that uh, are in need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land Minister of Justice, Public Safety and the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know that COVID-19 has been had an impact on island families everywhere. I imagine it's been particularly challenging for households going through separation or divorce, especially this past year. Government has offered supports like the online version of Positive Parenting from Two Homes course, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to announce another therapeutic justice program that will help many, in particular, island families. This program is called New Ways for Families. It is an innovative program that empowers parents with skills and strategies to manage high conflict situations. The program will be free to eligible families referred by the courts of Prince Edward Island, family court counselors, and the office of the children's lawyer. Mr. Speaker, this program will be a positive addition to the other supports currently being offered at the Family Law Centre to help families. New ways will be delivered online or in person to eligible island families depending on their needs. The Department of Justice and Public Safety will also be offering training on new ways to lawyers and therapeutic providers, such as social workers, because they are the key people in the island family support network. Mr. Speaker, this program is about empowerment. It focuses on four fun foundation skills, managing emotions, mod moderating behaviors, flexible thinking, and self-reflection. If we can empower family members with skills and knowledge to manage family conflicts before they reach the point of needing court intervention, we can help limit the negative consequences of separation and divorce. I'm proud the government is able to offer this free program to island families going through a challenging time in their lives. I want to thank the staff at the Family Law Center for m making a great program available to for islanders. New Ways for Families is an example of using upstream therapeutic approach to help diffuse conflict between people. The more therapeutic options we can provide to support the well-being of islanders, the better it will be for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's, it's always great to hear when there's a new program announced, um, particularly when it comes to supporting um, our children and families. Um, and so, you know, whenever we hear things like uh, it's about empowerment, it's about managing emotions, um, modifying behaviors, flexible thinking, self-reflection. We have a lot of um, great programs right now to support parents on PEI. And what we're hearing is that with the lack of community services to back these up, it's really, it makes it really hard for families. And, you know, I think it's really great. I, I'm thinking this is perhaps on a bit of a different level considering it's coming from justice and and so I know that some of the programs that we have are, are kind of our services that anyone can access whether it be through the school system or whatever um, such as uh, the behavior support teams in dino school um, 
strongest families, positive parenting from two homes, uh, triple P parenting. There, there are some really great programs. What I would really love for us to see, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm going to look into this program and I look forward to seeing what it involves. I would really like to see us back these up by community pr programs that support families um, and children because what, what we're hearing is that parents are struggling at home. And, and I've worked with people who have taken all of the, all of the parent programs and, and are still struggling, and which suggests to me that it's time for us to go a little bit deeper. So I look forward to looking at this. I thank the minister for, for this announcement, and uh, I look forward to learning more about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too want to thank the, the minister for this, this announcement. And um, yeah, there's, there's, it's just an unbelievable time and things that we've gone through lately uh, as a community, and we need more programs and more initiatives like this. And I do think that, that funding is going to be very important, and we have to see about, about how these are rolled out and, and, and evaluated. And, and just want to thank all Islanders for taking care of each other. But I think uh, it's good to see some leadership happening, and I'll, I'll, I look forward to talking to the minister about this. Anything for Islanders is good in this nature. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to clarify and provide factual information on residential housing in Prince Edward Island. Mortgage arrears on residential properties are a concern of this government, as they should be to all members of this House. However, on the 11th of March, some members were haphazardly throwing around data in this legislature that had misrepresented the situation. And I feel it is important to clarify this information that Islanders need and require, and which shows the reality within our province. Documents that I will table today show that while the Atlantic Province's rate of 0.38% is higher than the national average of 0.22%, this number has been decreasing year over year since 2016. This is important because it gives Islanders assurance that this situation has improved in recent years and has improved significantly during the past year. Mr. Speaker, the point that I am raising uh, uh, as members of this House, we need to be careful not to un unnecessarily raise alarm or shake confidence in our economy as we recover from the pandemic. Housing is important to all Islanders, and that is why we have programs such as the Down Payment Assistance Program, which is now expanded criteria, as well as waiving the island transfer tax on the first home purchased on PEI. Mr. Speaker, despite the pandemic, the housing and construction in industry had an overall positive year. But there are challenges, as some projects have been delayed due to the pandemic. Housing starts throughout the year declined by 23 percent from 2019. However, the province still recorded over 1,100 starts, the second most recorded since 1978. Housing completions increased 77 percent to 1,359 units, the most completed in a single year since 1974 and the third largest on record. We also experienced an improvement in the vacancy rate in Prince Edward Island, seeing it rise to 2.6% in 2020. Our strong housing sector is bolstered by our population growth, which has now reached over 160,000, a target that wasn't anticipated to be reached until 2022. This reinforces what we have always known, that Prince Edward Island is a desirable destination to live and work. Also, what we have seen with our property taxes is that we are within a half a percentage point to where we had been in the previous year, which shows that Islanders can and are paying their taxes. To any Islander who is struggling to pay their property tax, I encourage them to reach out to the taxation office so that we can work with them. Mr. Speaker, I am aware that there are still challenges regarding housing, and this is something we cannot tackle on our own. We need constant uh, Involvement with the Department of Social Development and Housing, as well as support and confidence from our network of private developers and the construction industry. Through our partnered efforts, we will continue to provide the support and confidence necessary so that housing can keep up with the demand, and we will continue to increase our inventory of affordable units for those who require them. To use numbers out of context and without background only seeks to confuse Islanders and shake confidence in our economy and will undermine our ability to recover from this pandemic. Our economy, which continues to celebrate success, requires the support and confidence of this House to help all industries recover from the pandemic.
This government has confidence in the economic prospects for our province and our islanders. I only wish the opposition members shared the view. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what? We don't live in an economy. We live in a society. And I am continually struck about um, the, the narrative about housing entirely about how many houses we build, how much it, the value of that is going into the economy, how many starts there are, how many people are employed. These are critical to our economy. But housing is not about building, only about buildings and jobs and what that looks like on our bottom line. Housing is about homes. If we don't have homes, we don't have islanders who feel safe, who have somewhere to live. We're not attractive for people to immigrate to. We can't keep the people we want to have stay here. And so when we talk about numbers out of context, I can give you a list of numbers out of context. I can give you a list about about how adding 100 new units to our affordable housing doesn't help when we have 2,000 island homes on either the housing registry or in insecure housing. We have a th over 1,000 people receiving rental vouchers because they literally cannot afford to rent where they are now, and the only way they can stay in housing is because we have to subsidize their rent because the market is so out of control. We have a thousand, over a thousand dollars waiting for social housing, and we cannot build enough housing in that space to meet the needs. So numbers out of context is we can't pat ourselves on the back for a super hot housing market and then say that we're doing the right thing for housing for islanders. Mr. Speaker, mortgage arrears are a small part of the story of what's happening in the economy here. And a change and a shift, and uh, I, am, I am speaking and I have the floor. The housing as an industry is not the only story of housing. Housing is about homes, Mr. Speaker. The down payment assistance program will allow some people to enter the market if they can find a home in their price range and can afford the mortgage that they're going to have to pay on a $350,000 starter home, which is about $1,500 a month before any other expenses, if you can manage to make that work for you under your low income wage. But down payment assistance programs make the housing market hotter. They make it more impossible for people to be able to afford. We have seen our house prices in PEI go up 35%, Mr. Speaker, in just over a year. It is an impossible market. Impossible. And we are now seeing that a vacancy rate shift, the data tells us, yes, it's gone up. You know why it's gone up? Because people can't afford to keep their things in short-term rentals anymore. So those units have gone back onto the rental market. You're right, that's going to affect the vacancy rate. And when we open up again, that's going to go right back down. So, Mr. Speaker, obviously, I feel quite passionate about this too. I am passionate about the number of units that are being built. I am thrilled that our building industry has a wait list of six months to get new apartments up and running. But you know what? We're not building the right things. We're not building them affordably. And we have to start being honest about the problem and honest about the numbers. And that side of the House just can't seem to get, get out of its own way. The Honourable Member from Charlotte Cornwall, Meadowbanks, Third Party Housing. That's tough to follow, Mr. Speaker. But it, it's, uh, you know, I've been in the position uh, in regards to responsible, uh, responsibility of housing, and a lot of the programs that the Minister actually spoke of was uh, the creation of, of this, uh, this corner of the House. And uh, it's good to see that they're advancing those because I think they are extremely important. Are they the answer? Definitely not. Um, but they are. They are, uh, it's, it's a challenging time. It's a challenging time right across the country. Home prices, as the Honourable Member said, up 20 to 35 percent in, in certain areas. So, you know, I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I know all the answers. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, the private developers are uh, doing what they can. Um, I will echo uh, uh, comments from uh, the Honourable Member in regards to the challenge of uh, building a new property today when your prices have gone skyrocketed and you're trying to put people into the reasonable rents and it's not happening. And I think that's part of, part of the major issue, uh, building homes and finding land. Land is at a premium as well. And uh, it's not easy. And I know when we were in power, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we did properties in O'Leary, Alberton, Summerside, Cornwall, Surrey, Montague, Stratford, and four or five uh, relevance in, in the Charlottetown area, and it's still not enough. Uh, but the problem with a lot of this in housing is how long it takes to build. 
a 24 unit or a 36 unit or a 48 unit. And then we have the, the immigration, obviously, and uh, the repatriation back to Prince Edward Island is huge as well. Um, people are um, migrating back to PEI, and that's a good thing, but it, it, creates, it creates a bubble that is, is tough to accomplish. So it, it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, I think governments now, and just recently, and I'll talk to, uh, I was speaking with Wayne Hamley, and uh, he has some ideas that maybe alleviate or, or at least reduce that $1,500 payment of a mortgage that they're trying to accomplish. But he needs support of government. These private developers can come with some ideas, and they may not be standard ideas that we've seen in the past, but they're innovative. And that's, if we're going to have any success in this housing market, if we're going to create anything that maybe hasn't been done before, then government has to stand up and acknowledge these ideas, go out on a limb and say, we're going to take a chance. Um, you know, when we started paying so much per door, and this government continues to do that, I mean, it was doing it out of a desperation. People are saying you shouldn't be doing that. Well, people need a place to live. It's a human right. And it's challenging, and it's challenging for the minister, it's challenging for the Minister of Economic Development, it's challenging for the Minister of Housing. But you have to find a way. But I will say this, you can't wait. You can't wait for the vacancy rate to go to three to four to five. You have to act now because it takes so long to create an atmosphere where people actually can access uh, a home. And we all know a home is everything. It's the family. It's everything. It's your health. It's everything. So I think the more that this government can do, the more that they will listen to those individuals that can create some sort of innovative ways to uh, induce the housing market on Prince Edward Island uh, and put in, you know, more, maybe it's more mobile parks, maybe it's more uh, government land that is, is provided and it's leased back to the owner of the property. Maybe it's mobile homes. Maybe it's Maybe it's uh, containers. Maybe it's small housing. <clears throat> if, it's a, if it's the pressure of putting, changing regulations or bylaws in municipalities to be able to do this, that's your government. That's what they're there for. Put the pressure on. Create something new. Go out on a limb, take some chances, and get it done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. End of minister statements. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I made a table letter from the Federation of Prince Edward Island Municipalities to the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, dated the 24th of February, 2021. And I move, second by the Minister of Agricultural Land, that the said document now be received and do lie on the table. Short carry. Carry. The Honourable Member from Charlotte Cornwall, Meadowbanks, and the Third Party House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to table written questions pertaining to government communications with EMS and Meta V, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Short carry. The Honourable Minister or Member from Cornwall, Meadowbanks, the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the question number one is please provide all written correspondence between the Minister of Health, Deputy Minister of Health, the Director of Research at the Mental Health and Addictions Divisions of Health PEI, and any representative of EMS and MetaV, including EMS Senior Operations Manager, on any matter, and since one, June 1st, 2019 to present. And question number two, Speaker, please provide a record of all phone calls, including dates, topic, and duration between the Minister of Health, Deputy Minister of Health, the Director of Research, at the Mental Health and Addictions Divisions of Health PEI and any representative of EMS and MetaV, including EMS Senior Operations Manager, on any matter since June 1, 2019. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table two documents from the journal Pioneer with, uh, with race results where the Minister of Finance has won. Um, and the, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Sure, Kerry. Okay. The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerogue, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
Speaker. I leave the House. I beg leave to table the West Prince Single Hospital Concept uh, re Final Report from 2006, submitted by the West Prince Single Hospital Consultation Committee, chaired by the current Minister of Health, which number one recommendation was to close the two hospitals in West Prince. And I move, seconded by the member from O'Leary and Verness, that the said document now be now be received in due line of table. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg leave to table documents from the Canadian Bankers Association referenced earlier that shows the number of re uh, residential mortgages in arrears, as well as charts that show this number has been declining. And I move, second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the said documents be now received and lie on the table. Shall I carry? I miss anyone? Reports by committees? The Honourable Member for Mermaid, Stratford, in opposition, House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee, and I move, seconded by the Member from uh, Montague Kilmuir, um, that, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 110.5, I intend to move the motion for adoption of the report tomorrow. Shall I carry? Thank you. No more reports by committees. I didn't sign it. Introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Yeah. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation that this House may now resolve itself in the committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant for supply to Her Majesty. Shall I carry? Yeah. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomero, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. This is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to Her Majesty. Uh, request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Um, right. You see the end? You see the end? You're, you're very positive. I like your. Uh, <laughs> Which section are we on? Honorable members, we had left on page 25 the section strategic policy and evaluation, policy planning and evaluation has been read, and we are still have questions on this? Yep. So the floor is now, oh, sorry. Um, Stranger, would you like to um, give us your name and position for Hansard? Mary Kinsman, Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Department of Agriculture and Land. Thank you very much. 
Um, so again, page 25, policy planning and evaluation. Any questions? Mermaid Strafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just trying to get my desk situ situated. Um, nice to see you again, Mary. Thank you for being here. Um, I, we're in the section of planning, and I've raised the topic already, and I'd just like to dig down a little bit more on it. So on the strategic plan, I think, Mary, you said that it's supposed to be prepared in the next two months. Is that correct? Um, I just want to point out, we, strategic planning always um, is associated with spending of the department, right? You take your strategic plan, you move that into an operational plan, it's operationalized, do you support it with a budget so that you can roll that out? So I just want to talk about the process that the department has gone through on their strategic planning and what steps they've taken. Um, so can you tell me, um, uh, so um, what what is the process so far that's been undertaken in order to develop the strategic plan for agriculture? Um, uh, I, I can help you through part of it. Okay. Thank you. So the um, management team met with uh, the uh, director of, of uh, policy planning and evaluation. Uh, so he's part of the management team. So uh, we met. Um, we went through you know, uh, a planning process and kind of a you know what what we thought priorities and uh, whatever would be. The, and then they took they take over that process. Um, so uh, they would have done some environmental scans, um, and then they collect. They would have. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they did a, a survey with staff or they met directly with staff. Uh, that would have been outside my unit. Um, and then uh, they drafted. A, pl a plan, an, an initial piece, uh, was reviewed with uh, strategic uh, with uh, management, and we made some suggestions of where it should go from there. Then they they delved deeper. They uh, revised a plan, um, and it's it's now close to being completed. Okay. But I can't give you exactly the steps that they uh, went through in their preparation. I was I can just kind of tell you the the pieces where I was present. Okay. Yeah. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And you said, who did you say was leading it? Is it the policy department within the Department of Agriculture and Land? Yes, it's this group. Uh, so it would be uh, this unit of the Policy Planning and Evaluation yeah. Unit is leading it. Yeah. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. And um, were there are there any consultations with stakeholders, in, like including any um, the third party opposition or anything like that on the strategic plan or outside with the Federation of Agriculture, PEI Potato Board, any of those PEI Cattlemen's Association? Was there consultations outside of government? Um, I, I can't give you, I, I don't, I would have to go get that information for you. Okay. I can say, like, there's quite a bit of consultation that happens because we, we have a lot of programming. And so when we do our, our federal and provincial programming, they are in consultations with all of those groups. and. Uh, on a regular base, basis, like uh, they are now uh, gearing up now again for our, uh, a new program, uh, our, our federal provincial program. We're in year four of five. So it is common for them to meet with all of the agriculture groups. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you for that, Mary. And it's not lost to me that a strategic plan is a huge endeavor. I, I completely understand that. I mean, I've gone through it with large corporations, and it's uh, you know months of planning, and it's months of um, consolidating consolidating the information, putting the programs forward, analysis of programs, and all that kind of. Stuff. I completely understand the complexity of the strategic plan, but I do recognize once that's completed, you have a document then that you can hold um, all of the areas accountable for achieving what you've set out to achieve. Um, so it's a it's a major piece of good governance. Um, it's hard to have good governance when you don't actually have um, accountable uh, performance indicators listed and, and that kind of thing. So, um, do you know the delivery model? Like, do you know how in depth the strategic plan is? Does it identify performance indicators for all of the different programs within ag within agriculture and you know listing how that's going to be achieved, etc. This. Uh 
all of our programs, anytime we develop, uh, change, update our programs, there's always performance measurements attached to it. This group is attached. Anytime we start anything new, um, policy is part of that conversation. So they are in the meetings from the beginning. And when we um, negotiate new agreements with the federal government or whomever, they are part of the team that does that negotiation because they always add that piece to everything that we're doing. Okay. Mary Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And so at the end of this, is there a, like an annual evaluation pro process that's going to be undertaken where you, once you've deli delivered on the strategic plan, um, that you do the measurements and you look at where we are at the, like annually, so that we can make adjustments. Even before the end of the year, there should be benchmarks. But um, is there an annual evaluation process attached to this? Uh, they would, on a regular basis, monitor and report. So um, I can't say if it's annual or biannual or what that is, but that is part of what they, um, Part of, always part of their plan. It's some, like any time we're doing any type of a program, they'll say you have to report quarterly or semi-annually or annually or biannually. Mm -hmm. I can't say for sure if this one, what, what period of time that one is, but it would have some kind of reporting time frame in it. Thank you. Mayor Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, and question to the Minister on this one. So, Minister, I know um, it took a little bit of time to develop it, but once it was, um, once it was tabled in the House, the, the project plan for Land Matters PEI has taken us so many questions out of that whole process and how everything was going to work. Um, with, I mean, there wasn't dates put in that, which is one big missing component, right? Because scope, timeline, and budget is the triangle that creates any good project. And so it's important to actually um, identify timeline. You've identified the scope, important to identify timeline. That would be my only. Um, issue with the current project plan for that project. I just wanted to highlight when when a document like that is put out, it it really just eliminates so many questions because we know what to expect. The time frame in which we should be expecting it is valuable. But that that um, project plan that was put out, um, I think that that is something that should be recognized as a really good piece of work but it should be incorporated not just into your department, but it's across government, that that should be something that should be readily available to the public so the public can recognize and can have real expectations of when project programs are going to be delivered. And we've seen, we've talked about it, and I'm, I'll point out you know, the third option and Thousand First Days and those kinds of programs. If there's a solid project plan behind that with timelines associated to it, I worked in project management before I came here, and I recognize how accountable a project manager has to be. I just wanted to put out there that nothing is a plan unless it's on paper, and that you can actually then put it out there to be held accountable to it. So I just wanted to say on the Land Matters PEI piece, that's a really good model to share across departments, and I think that that's something that um, good governance should be built on. And uh, I'd like to see that strategic plan also built in that same way. I think it's just truly important for the public to see it. Well, um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm quite proud of our policy department and uh, doc led by Dr. Bobby Cameron. He, I think he's one of our uh, shining light in government and policy. Uh, the work he's done, he's, he did the land matters uh, strategic plan or the plan for the land matters and he's working on our strategic plan and uh, it will be published when it's done and I look forward to uh, it'll it'll be uh, be happy to share it with everyone and there will be timelines in it and there it will be have all the checks and measures and everything we do in agriculture is evaluated uh, we have all the cap cap funding programs that is all the measurements are taken all the reviews and uh, uh, are done and uh, so we're very we're probably one of the best uh, departments at evaluation and in our policy group so yeah. thank, you. thank you and I, and I can appreciate that I mean but also with the the work back schedule on it you what you need is your strategic plan prior to a budget so I would love to see the it moved back in time 
so that that is something that's made public. So then when we're sitting here, that'll remove so many questions instead of sitting here for days going through the budget because it'd be so visible like it, when it's sitting there on a piece of paper for people to see how it all connects together. And uh, so I appreciate that. But one thing I do want to recognize with the department is, so there was a junior policy analyst program within the Department of Agriculture. And I think, Minister, that speaks to why you are policy heavy and why you're able to put out this type of um, planning. And I think it's showing its benefits. Is that junior policy analyst program still in place? And if so, how many spaces are um, are, are, is there available? It's still available, and I'll, have to, I'll get Mary to answer. Uh, there's one position, and it, it's filled annually. So they, they stay in, uh, co they come for a year under uh, Bobby's Cameron's, Dr. Bobby Cameron's supervision, and uh, that, so it's turned over once a year. Okay. Remember, it's Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And is that a is that a analyst that analyst program? So that one person that comes in, are they then have the ability to move to other departments within government and work within government to take that skill set and ensure that we all departments benefit from that program? It's kind of the uh, the reason why the uh, why we created the position, why Bobby created the position was was a training ground for that. And then if positions come open, they're available for them to apply to. Yes. Thank you, Chair. And I'm going to go right back to measurement. So, um, you know, we, we measure success on the amount of people like um, that we can um, develop from junior positions and moving them up into senior positions. Do you have a Do you have any idea of how many people who have gone through that program are still with, with government and working within, maybe not in Department of Agriculture, but within other departments? I just think it's something that yeah. we should be recognizing that. Policy is important, and if we're training people, are we allowing them to be promoted up through the system? Uh, where they are now, I can't tell you, but I, I know um, uh, they are it, they are available to they are eligible to apply for jobs within government after they have their year, um, and I, 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 I would have to come back to you with the numbers. Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and that that's the kind of like annual reporting and, and success indicators that you want to be able to put out there, right, of the, the investment that you make in, in that training process or that junior process and, and moving it upwards. So um, for the policy evaluation work that goes through the department, can you talk about that evaluation and, and that work and um, how it's unique to, if it's unique to the Department of Agriculture versus other departments, is there any other types of... Um, policy evaluation that happens to that extent. Do you know that? Well, this, 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 like I said, the strength of our department is our policy and evaluation group, and uh, they evaluate all the programs and services, and they use evidence-based uh, decision making. And uh, um, every my deputy minister tells me we are the uh, shining example of government. So. I can't give you all the details, but I know we're doing a great job in policy and uh, our evaluation. Thank you. Mayor Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And, uh, and that's great to hear, like when you have a model that's working well and if the Deputy Minister is saying that there must be performance measurements that he's using in order to be able to make those statements. Um, I often say like the Auditor General, every performance audit, audit or uh, value for money audit, um, whether it's in one department or not, the the, the things that are identified and the recommendations that are put forward can be carried across all departments and all departments should be looking at each of them to see how they can incorporate the good practices. And so I would think it would be great if, you know, if you have that, sh that great model, that best, that best practice or good practice model at this point in time that you should look at bringing that across all departments and how you can do that. And that would be, I think, a really good step for government um, from the, if you have such a great program, right? How do you carry that through to make make it into all the other departments? Um, so I don't know if this is the right place to talk, uh, the Farmers Talk campaign. And um, the, what, what um, how do you see this program expanding more 
I know that we do a lot of performance measurements on this. We, ha we know how many people are using it, how many times they're using it, and what kind of topics are coming through, and that it is growing. The need for it, unfortunately, is growing. What kind of expansion pro um, plans uh, do you have? Well, I, I think we, we can't uh, emphasize this enough. Uh, I'm personally taking an advocacy on this. Uh, I've witnessed too many... Uh, too many sad situations in farming, so I am uh, going to champion this cause, Farmers Talk. It's um, it's only going to grow. Actually, yesterday I had the uh, national campaign of Do More Ag reach out to me and wants to work with Farmers Talk. Uh, they, they're the national body that um, is pr funded privately, but it's it covers the national agricultural industry and Minister Bebo has uh, reached out to me too and wants to uh, see if we can uh, do a national program as well. So I see this building, um, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick don't have acts or don't have, uh, they have a certain programs but they, they want to talk with us about adding to theirs. So we're, we're we're open to building this, and but we got to look after our own farmers and the farmer assist program and the farmers talk together. I think it's a great uh, coverage for farmers across this island. But uh, I wish we didn't need it, but we do. Mermaid Stratford, I agree with you, Minister. Um, I appreciate that, and I am completely supportive to whatever expansion on the program needs to happen. Um, just a final question on this section. Um, we always know that you never get 100% of what you ask for. You, you sometimes it's zero that you get. Sometimes it's you know some sort of fraction or percentage. Um, can you um, tell me what programs would have been put forward to the budget that were not approved in this current budget that you would have liked to have seen? Mary. On, like when we sit down to do our budget preparation, we sit down and we, we review where, what we've done, where we're going, um, and we're responsible. It's uh, you know public funds, so we're responsible in, in what we put forward. Um, you know, and and in our in this whole budget, you will see that. It's not the same from year to year to year. You, you see ups and downs, mm -hmm. and that's because we take a look at it. Our policy unit evaluates different things. We move money around and or reallocate it to areas where we th think uh, we need to focus in a, a particular year. I mean, our, 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 some of our Fed pro programs, no, those are that's a steady number every year, but you'll also see that we move the money around, like last year. When we talked about the bee pro pollination program yesterday, that was the $300,000 provincial-only program. But we were able to add another $200,000 from the from the CAP program. So we take a look during the year or, or ahead of time and say, like, what's important, what's coming up. But that all of that part is part of the planning, um, and 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 that's what our planning group is 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 part. And, and not just them. It's it's the the, the our, our specialists and whatever. You know, we have to gather that information. Um, so whether things are turned down or, or, or approved, it's, you know, you put together what uh, the best budget uh, that we think we can, what we need to do to meet the needs of our clients. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think there was any major projects turned down. Um, maybe because of COVID, there wasn't as much um, big projects asked for. So we did sit down not too long ago, Mary, and uh, we... We reached out to 4-H program and uh, we went to Siggy Siggy Fund uh, to see if they were interested in some funding to up. Since 4-H is doing has to do things differently, we said let's try to help them out some more. So we uh, fifty thousand dollars we we made available through Siggy if they wanted to upgrade their computer systems or think outside the box. You know it wasn't just to uh, for salaries, but it was to uh, improve that they could offer. 4-H uh, in a in a post-COVID world, or so. Right. That's one of the funding we did. Mayor Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And just one last question on this, and and you know, I 
going through many budget processes. I know you gather up, you know, all the projects and then you kind of analyze, the, analyze them and really you should kind of rank them by importance, return on investment and all that kind of stuff. Um, did you find, so usually there's pre, in-person pre-budget consultations that would happen prior to the budget and that was done online for the most part. Did you see any challenges in that process in that um, uh, possibly um, not as many people would have replied through that process to the Department of Ag and Land? Or was that? And uh, it wouldn't have been come directly through me, like our policy people would have dealt with that and gathered, gathered information. But, uh, you know, uh, this particular year was a challenging, challenging year, but the great thing is, is most of us adapted. So we just we, we just communicated different ways. Mm -hmm. So okay. Mermaid Stratford. I'm good, thank you, Chair. Um, Charlottetown, Brighton. Yes. I have a couple of questions. I was wondering, the policy and planning is that related just to things happening within the department, or do you look outside to like uh, what's the status of land planning? How much land to use to development or? markets, new markets in the Far East and stuff like that. What is the scope of your planning? So uh, the planning department does the policy work and that the department's going to go forward with uh, some, some of our projects. Um, uh, we have uh, economists on, on in our policy department that looks at uh, industries and uh, the economics of uh, that policy. It's everything from land matters to uh, legislation. So that's what our planning department does. Okay. Thank Charlton you. Brighton. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Charlton West Royalty. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Mm -hmm. I guess you're just waving at me. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Um, is, this is the section where the, the farmer's assistance program is contained, right? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask some questions about that. Um, the, has that program been expanded? I think originally it was uh, six free counseling sessions for a farmer or his or her spouse and family. Is that, is that still the, what the criteria are for that? I'm not sure on the, um, how many counseling sessions is if there's a limit. Um, that was the original. Uh, I'll have to go back and check. Um, but in 2020, they did 293 counseling sessions, so um, with 166 clients. So that's farm families, farmers, farm families, and farm workers. So, yeah. Leader of the opposition. So is there a is there a cap on the amount the government is willing to support, or is it just as many farmers and their family members as come forward? So we upped that from, it was 25,000 when I came in, it's up to over 30,000 now that we're, and then plus we have the Farmers Talk right. program that we're also building off on. So uh, there's no, we're, if the Federation, they, they run that, so if they request more money, we'll definitely look at that, yeah. Leader of the opposition. And are there certain um, counselors or therapists that are particularly um, you don't have experience in this field or um, are called on regularly to speak with farmers who understand the business and the particular yeah. stresses? That's, yeah, all the councillors are familiar with the farming industry. So. Leader of the opposition. And, I mean, in some other areas we're using telehealth, particularly for psychiatric and, and psychological counselling. Is that, are, are any of these through telehealth or are they all in person with it's, island counsellors? It's both. It's telehealth mostly, both. actually. Yeah. Okay. All right. Leader of the Opposition. So do we have any sense of whether those uh, uh, programs are actually providing, the help to, what's the feedback from farmers, I guess, is a better way of putting it? Um, I, our feedback is, is that it's working and uh, I, I I don't know if I wanted to say this is a success, or I don't know if, how you measure success, but to, since it started, no farmer has taken his life, so or farm family, so I guess we'll call that a success. So I'm not sure the measurements, uh, but I don't think we're going to uh, 
I think we just have to keep adding to it. And uh, it's all about awareness and the stigma and about farming. And uh, I know myself that it's, it's a stressful business and there's so many um, things are out of your control. So it's all about stigma and awareness and that you're not alone. And I will champion this program for a long time to come. Leader of the Opposition. I appreciate your comments, uh, Minister, and I 100% concur with, with what you've said. You mentioned that the funding has gone from 25 to 30 in the, the last year. Mm -hmm. um, do we know whether that was sufficient to meet the demand? Um, we'll have to do a review, but they didn't ask for any more this year. So. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. And uh, of course, this has been a unique and peculiar year in all kinds of ways, um, no less so in the agricultural community than elsewhere. So hopefully, if we get a regular year, if there is ever such a thing <laughs> yeah. in farming, I, um, I'd like one. <laughs> some of those stresses will, will be reduced. So I, I, again, I appreciate the program that's there. Um, I also, you, just because it's a new program, the, or the, the website, the, the Farmers Talk, um, can you just talk a little bit about uh, how that works and whether, whether you feel that's been a useful addition? Um, so it's, it's uh, my concern with Farmers Assist Program was that it was, it was just a number. It's a toll-free number. And uh, my concern, it wasn't, it didn't resonate that was the first place to go. So, for, so we, the department, with help from Bobby Cameron, and came up with Farmers Talk as a trendy. It, it resonates with farmers. So, uh, so we, we, when we launched that, it added to the Farmers Assist program, which is on. I must say that number in Farmers Talk is on every envelope that leaves the Department awesome. of Agriculture. So, I think it was over 1,600 uh, mail. Envelopes have right on the front farmers assist the phone number and farmers talk and uh, so farmers talk is just a portal that will lead you if you, it, it's encouragement it's uh, it's just there to uh, direct you to if you if this is how you're feeling go here and don't don't hesitate so it's it's working out well we've had a, a large amount of feedback uh, from farms. Um, had a farmer call me the other day that uh, on my way to the legislature said uh, he said thank you for bringing farmers talk he said I thought I'd give you a call because politicians don't have that <laughs> same helpline so <laughs> and just wished me well that day and uh, so I thought that was pretty nice but uh, yeah no times are tough and yeah leader of the opposition that is a nice story uh, yes. minister yeah. <laughs> um <clears throat> Just again, so I understand, I, 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 and I've, I haven't been to the website, so forgive me for not, not having anything to compare this with, but I got the sense that this was more a sort of peer support mm -hmm. network than it was a, a, a way of navigating to a councillor, but does it do both of those things? It does Can both you? of those things. Yes. It does. Okay, great. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Thanks, Minister. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total strategic policy and evaluation, 1,297,800. Shall I carry? Animal health, regulatory, and analytical labs. Animal health and research. Appropriations provided to assist the agriculture and aquaculture industries in animal health product, protection, promotion, and disease prote uh, prevention. Administration, 4,300. Equipment, 6,500. Material supplies and services, 5,600. Professional services, 100,600. Salaries, 574,400. Travel and training, 14,500. Grants, 300,000. Total animal health and research, 1,005,900. Any questions? Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Uh, Minister, no doubt you were aware a, a few weeks ago there were some stories circulating about s representatives from the Department of Agriculture um, showing up, attending a farm, and then euthanizing animals there. And uh, there were, uh, you know, there were a lot of. <laughs> social media is a place where we have to b b move very carefully, and I just want to give you this opportunity to, to clear up perhaps some of the things that were said about that, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, the I can't say a whole lot about that except for so, social media maybe 
took things a little the other way. Um, uh, I think the departments, everyone needs to be aware that the animals, the well-being of the animals is the, is the utmost importance of our officers that go out, our animal welfare officers. And um, uh, I think we need to uh, be aware of that and they do a tremendous job it's it's not an easy job and I know there's emotions involved um, but I can't really comment on that particular situation because it's under investigation and uh, so I I can't uh, comment on it but all the codes were followed in the act and uh, I assure you that uh, the welfare of the animal was the utmost important leader of the opposition I appreciate the fact about uh not being able to discuss the details of the case, uh, Minister. So what could you tell us, though, in a more general sense, what the process is when the province does indeed euthanize animals? So uh, the province doesn't actually do the euthanization. Uh, the province goes out and investigates, and in this, ca in, in this case, is the same as well. It, we, we get a call that an animal is in distress or an animal is, being, is not in good shape, so we go out and investigate. And if the officer uh, feels that um, the animal needs, if is in distress, or he, the vet, a veterinarian is called. Always a veterinarian is called, and it's uh, the veterinarian that either euthanizes it or makes the decision whether it needs to be euthanized or not. So it's we don't make that decision. It's it's the veterinarian. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. I appreciate that clarification. That obviously has relevance to the case yes. I, I mentioned uh, a little while ago. So has the province considered adopting some standards for the regulation of animal sanctuaries as they do in some other provinces? As we're um, re reviewing the Animal Welfare Act, I think we are, we are uh, going to look at animal sanctuaries as well. Leader of the Opposition. Any time frame on when that uh, review of the Act might be done? Um, Mary, do we have a, I'm not sure if we have a... I don't have a timeline on that. Uh, we do have a... a, a Surveys out. It's, it, we have one yeah. temporary position that's gathering uh, the information, uh, and that'll be for at least a year. They'll be gathering information and they'll work with the legislative person, but I don't know, I don't know the timeline on when they hope to have uh, legislation completed. Leader of the Opposition. And how, how has the response been to that call for input in, in the review of the Act? It's been huge. Uh, there's a big yeah. uptake on, you know, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's, it's quite large. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Um, I'm not sure whether this is the right place, but um, rehab, rehabber's permits, is that something that would fall in this area? I know there's a, an individual on PEI who's been trying to become licensed is a rehabilitation wildlife person. I'm not getting the terminology right then. Their uh, re rehabber permits is the is the title. I, that falls under the uh, environment. Okay. File. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that for now. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. So, um, you mentioned that you're considering uh, regulating animal sanctuaries when this update of the Animal Welfare Act is done in a year or whenever it happens. So, how are they? How does the province currently regulate them? Um, well, they just f fall under our current Welfare Act that we have now, so it's uh, they're considered a firm. Um, uh, so we really have to, uh, because more and more of them are mm -hmm. seem to be popping up all the time. So it's important that we take a focus just on uh, on sanctuaries. Leader of the opposition. So there are no specific regulations related to sanctuaries because I presume that's they're not actually specified in the regulations or the act, are they? Not, not particularly. No. Okay. Leader of the opposition. So they they just have to comply with whatever regulations and rules would apply to any other farm yes. uh, in terms of animal welfare. And, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. So I'd, I'd like to move on to uh, fish kills for a minute. Am I? Is this, again, the right section to talk about that? I'm talking about what the department's role is in reducing or eliminating um, the land use practices as they relate to fish kills, and we all, we all understand where the 
where the problem arises. Um, and I'm just wondering what the protocols are in the department, if there are any, to uh, address a fish kill. I understand that falls in environment, but, but because agriculture is involved, I'm just wondering right. what it, the connecting... It was in the previous section, but... Uh, oh, I'm, I apologize yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, our role is to, after environment goes in, we go in and make sure all farm practices were followed. Um, environment deals with the fish kill itself, but we, we deal with the farm practices. Um, that's, our, that's our role. You're the opposition? So there were a couple of fish kills in 2020, you know, a small number as the averages go over the years, and that's great. But um, are you at a place or can you share any information on what happened in those particular instances and what, what caused them? Uh, that would be a question for environment. I do know that uh, our investigators found uh, the investigation lies in the environment, so I, right. I shouldn't speak on that. But uh, the, the firm practices, there was no um, irregularities in the firm practices that were found to cause to cause the fish kills. Okay. Leader of the opposition, appreciate that, Minister. Uh, I know my colleague Marmaid Stratford asked a number of questions on pollinators and bees the other day when we were we were here, but I just I just want to. Uh, push you for a particular number. She was particularly concerned, I think, about the importation of bees and, and the protocols and how that has changed. And I know she asked you about some wording in the regulations from, you know, each of the last three years to perhaps, I, I can't remember the exact details, but have you have you spoken to anybody about that? Uh, briefly this morning, I didn't have a, a large opportunity to time this morning to unpack that, but I, I will we will be in contact with the beekeepers association here to see if we can where we can go and if there's any movement on either way so leader of the opposition and a final question on on this section and it's to do with uh, the number of hives um if if we find a, cer a certain number of um hives that are contaminated um what what number would it take to actually close the border to bees do you have a hard number there if we found contamination? Exactly. Well, um, I, I don't know if there's a hard number. I shouldn't say that without having the protocol in front of me, but uh, any indication, the, the, the bees are destroyed immediately, so any contamination, so the hives are destroyed. Um, but um, we haven't found any contamination since we started doing this, so uh, I'm hoping this year we'll be the same. Okay. I did say it was the last the question, opposition. I apologize, no uh, uh, Chair. The, um, and this is just from my own, my own uh, memory, when you were having the discussion the other day, I think I heard that the, the, the um, investigations will be done actually here on the island, is that right? Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, if we're importing bees and we find that a certain number of hives have been infected with SHP, um, would we, is there a certain number whereby any further importation would come come to a stop? Oh, definitely, That's yeah. The, the protocols would strengthen right then any bees from that area, same same right. area, right? The same apiary or so. and, and I guess I'm just looking for what that, what that note, is it one hive? If we find that, then the border is shut until we figure out where this came from, or is it five or what? So if there's anything found it's immediately taken off the island like immediately like that's the protocol uh, i'll have to get back to you on what what happens if we find one but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for for me that's critical i, I appreciate you uh, okay. i'm good for now chair thank you shall the section carry regulatory services and product development appropriations provided for the enforcement of legislation and the operation of services and programs associated with animal health and welfare and plant health. This section is also responsible for product and market development programs. Administration 11,900. Equipment 3,800. Material supplies and services 280,100. Professional services 8,800. Salary 731,600. Travel and training 95,700. Grants 1,196,200. Total regulatory services and product development, 2,328,100. Valerian Furness.
Uh, just to kind of follow up a little bit on the last, uh, some of the questions that the Leader of the Opposition was around the veterinary services. So when you do get a call on a particular issue, and I've been a minister and I've kind of, you get a fair number of calls, it was actually quite surprising. Uh, your department goes out and investigates, uh, then the, a decision is sort of made whether a, a vet should be uh, uh, asked to uh, come in and take a look at the situation and once again make decisions at that point. Can you give me a sense of how many calls you get and how many actually uh, get to the point where a vet goes and takes a look at it, uh, the situation? Do you have that? No, I, don't. I, I don't have those figures in front of us, but we do. We get a, a, a f quite a few numbers. Uh, I know the officers are busy, particularly in the springtime of the year when animals can look. Um, they can look a little rough because of the long winter, and so they tend to get a few more calls then or in in the middle of winter when it's cold yeah. out. And, mm -hmm. But uh, luckily we haven't had to uh, put down too many animals or have, you know, it's it's busy, but uh, it's not as, it's not drastic. Uh, Oliver and Vernets. I guess where I'm trying to come from is that obviously people will drive by and they see a horse out in the field or whatever it might be, and it, it could be a cold winter's day or what have you. And uh, they'll make a call, and uh, you know we'll send our staff person out, take a look at the situation, and, and the horse might be fine, as an example. So I'm just trying to get a sense of how many, I don't know if I'll say vexatious calls you get, but people that are maybe misinformed. They, they, so our department follows up. We always follow up with it, as, as I recall when we were a minister. Uh, but, uh, but I say there was really... Uh, and if I look at the budget here, you've got $8,700. You know, it's not a lot of money that you're paying a vet to go do that uh, inspection to make that judgment call to whether there needs to be further action. In other words, remove the animal and take it to another place or put the animal down or whatever it might be. Uh, so it would seem to me that it's not a lot. You probably not get a lot of calls. I'm sure a vet, at eight, you know... <laughs> $8,700 for all PEI for a year is not, not a whole lot of calls. So no. I'm just trying to get a sense, is it two to one, four to one, things of that nature. And I think that puts it a lot into perspective, I think, as far as uh, uh, how many people maybe are a little bit misinformed about what a situation looks like on, uh, on a farm or, or a situation. And, and, you know, an animal, like say, may be outside but may not be right. unhealthy at all. It might even be more healthier than if it's in a barn or right. vice versa if it's in a barn. Uh, uh, there could be uh, other issues with, by being in a barn that may be uh, a detriment to the animal's health. So, Definitely getting, I, I, I don't want to give a ratio for sure, because uh, I, 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 I wouldn't want to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. But it, there is some, I wouldn't say fixatious calls, it's more uh, people uninformed or un, uneducated on what actually they see, and uh, I think, but, but that's the what you have to have to ensure that all animals are uh, are looked after properly, and so it's a small price to pay, I guess. To yeah. well, Larry Inverness. I guess. Uh, it, do you have those stats so that you can bring that back? Uh, I do. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't reading very closely. There were five incidences. Like, so it, the the cost for the vet is is the inspectors. If they have concerns, yeah. they they will call for a, a vet and. Um, there were five incidents where they were called uh, at when probably in Febu by February when we prepared these notes were five mm -hmm. incidents that were where veterinarians were called. Well, Larry Inverness. So, so that's, uh, that's very few. Five, yeah. five is far lower than I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, but anyway, it, so would you have the numbers of how many calls you get? Uh, uh, you know, we get about one call a week. So you get about 52 calls, say, and you had five cases. Yeah. Okay, that, that kind of gives a, put it into a bit of perspective for me. And the vet will go to approximately 5%. So yeah. It's Polary. not Polary. Polary. Oh, Okay, Vanessa. thanks. That, that's all for me, Chair. Um, Charlottetown Victoria Park. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. And, and I, I realize this is the question I'm going to ask kind of goes across all the different sections. So... If, if you want me to wait, I'd be happy to do that. Um, a little while ago, I was pre pleasantly surprised to see that your department had released, uh, I forget what it's called, I did read it, but it's just a, the gender, it wasn't a gender-based analysis, but you did kind of a, uh, a look into how gender affects 
agriculture, which I really appreciated, and it had some really good um, details in it. And I'm wondering how, given the fact that that was released by your department and the announcement that there has been a gender diversity lens put over the entire budget, I'm just wondering if you can give me any um, direction or any examples of how that changed something in the budget, whether it added it or changed it or took it out or whatever. Well, um, I don't... I don't mean to brag about my department, but I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've we're, we've gotten the gold star from government on our diversity and our uh, from that study that Dr. Bobby Cameron did. Actually, uh, it's we are we're leading government with our gender balance and our uh, diversity. Um, so we're quite proud of that. We have a great staff that are. Uh, in, very much engaged, and uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, as Department of Agriculture is, and we've been called this, the gold standard, um, we've had extra funding under our, for our underrepresented groups to try to increase that, so uh, I'm not sure, Mary, if we have numbers for that. But, uh. I, don't, I don't have specific numbers, but some programs would have a higher percentage that, that funding that would be available. Chair on Victoria Park. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can give me any specific examples of, of programs or, or funding. Um, funding for to find ways to get women into more leadership roles. Mm -hmm. We've had that um, with the, um, yes. any of the federal government funding that comes through us, there's always extra money for uh, underrepresented groups as well. So we, we, all, it, we uh, apply that to our, our f any fed federal programs that we've had. So I don't know if there's anything to add to that, Mary. I guess that's about it. Like Charlotte Victoria Park? Yeah. Uh, and is there is this something that you're measuring? Um, yes. Yeah. No. Uh, there is a. Uh, we do have a report out um, uh, that we can table. So I'll bring that. Okay. Charlotte Town Victoria Park. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate that. I'd just love to look through it to kind of see it. If, you know, if if your um, department gets a gold star, I'd love to see what what that looks like and, okay. and just to, to kind of yeah. get a feel for, for what you're doing and, and how that might be applied to other departments as well. So thank Absolutely. you, Chair. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Our, our office, as you know, Ministers, has been in conversations with the Department regarding updating the DOG Act, and I'm wondering whether you have a date when the Department will be tabling the legislation to update that Act? Uh, we're still hoping to... Um, to get it this session, but we're there's no guarantees. But we're we're, we're still hoping to get it sooner than later. But for sure this fall. But we we want to get it done right um, to make sure it's. And we've I know my staff has reached out to you and your constituents, and uh, I think we're making great headway on that. And I think it's important. It'll be an important piece of legislation when it comes amendments. So looking forward to it. Leader of the opposition. I agree, and I've appreciated the open. Uh, sort of the, the way that we have approached this, you know, we came forward with a concern and had our own amendments. Mm -hmm. uh, the department chatted with us about some ways that they felt they could actually strengthen what we had brought forward, and it was a very constructive conversation, and as you just said, constituents from District 17 uh, were the sort of catalyst for, for getting this whole thing going. So I, I'm really glad things are moving forward. I do hope it comes this spring. I know there's a certain consultation element to it, yeah. which will also have to be carried out. Um, which leads me to think it would be optimistic that it will come this spring, but I, I'm glad things are moving forward, and I, I, mean, I, I just, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, okay. I'm grateful for that. Yeah, okay. um, there's been some discussion, and this has happened in some other jurisdictions, about whether it's appropriate to leave this kind of legislation, animal welfare legislation, for example, Dog Act legislation, in the Department of Agriculture, because uh, 
a lot of people feel it would make sense, and indeed other jurisdictions have done that, to move it to another department. Typically, it's moved to the Department of Justice. I, I won't ask you if you've spoken with the uh, Minister of uh, Minister of Justice, Justice. And Attorney General. But <laughs> Doesn't matter which department's in. Yeah. But I'm wondering whether. <laughs> I'm, wonder, um, I'm wondering whether you've had any conversations within either or both departments as to <laughs> no, whether No, we have. We have. Um, agriculture would love to, to, for it to go to justice, and justice is happy to have it in agriculture, but <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, it might be an ongoing discussion as we the Animal Welfare Act comes forward after our, with all the consultation that's going over, and uh, we'll make an evaluation then. Leader of the opposition. So I'm wondering, you, you mentioned there that neither department, it sounds like a little bit of a hot potato, and I, I understand that. It's a, it, it's a tricky area it of is, law. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm wondering what on what you will base, you know, whether it stays in agriculture or moves somewhere else. <clears throat> I don't mind it in agriculture because you have, um, you have agriculture-minded people dealing with animals. Uh, I think maybe in justice it might get lost. Uh, it might not have that um, same aspect, but right now they do, we are working with the conservation officers. They actually, uh, if we need enforcement, we use the conservation officers now, um, and that, that's been working really well. Um, there's been a couple circumstances where we had to seize animals and uh, um, the conservation officers really stepped up and added that enforcement to it and uh, kept it, uh, our animal welfare officers safe and everybody safe involved. So. The opposition? And some of those enforcement officers are, are with the PEI Humane Society, as you know, mm -hmm. they are often called upon to enforce this act. And there's a, in Ontario, as you likely know, the Ontario Humane Society moved that you know they, they got so uncomfortable with following sort of carrying out those dual roles of being advocates for animal welfare and also having to and carry guns and and, and right. do the stuff that you were just talking about um, so that was taken out of their hands and I I'm wondering whether a similar discomfort or you, you say it's being enforced very well across the province but uh, have you had conversations with with the Humane Society here on Prince Edward Island and have they expressed any concerns about that uh, what I just described there? We have had, uh, last year we met with the Humane Society and uh, we increased our funding for them. So they they never indicated any concerns. Um, they are still willing to do the work and uh, they just wanted to be, uh, wanted to be compensated for <laughs> their extra sure. work they're doing. And, uh, yeah. and we, did, we did step up and do that. Um, but we are following what's happening in T Ontario, and we're going to kind of measure what that jurisdiction, how how things are turning out there, and we'll make that make that judgment call. Leader of the opposition, thanks, and I'm glad to hear that. And they are, they do do excellent work, and that's not the point I'm trying to make here. It's the disconnect between one right. part of their mandate and, and this. Yeah. And that, we again. have good communications with them, and uh, so far they haven't had that uncomfortable conversation with us yet. So. Um, Chair one, oh, sorry, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. One of the, uh, and this is going back to the amendments to the, to the Act in whatever form they come forward from your department, but one of the big problems is that uh, unincorporated areas, which account for 90%, I think it is, of the land base on PEI, um, have and do not have any laws, and, and the province has to pick that up. But even in a municipal, and, and that's pretty clear, the province is responsible if it's unincorporated. But when it's a municipality, an in incorporated area, and, and these areas are expanding now as we talk, um, unless that municipality has a specific dog bylaw, then it's a sort of gray zone. It's, an, it's a municipality, and therefore it doesn't fall under the province. But if they don't have a, a dog act, then the municipality itself is powerless, literally, to do anything about it. Um, what, what are we going to do to, to close that gap? Well, that's a that's a... That's a tough question because you want I th the government has the responsibility to, to. I think we have to step up and and uh, enforce our animal welfare laws across the island, no matter where you live. Um, 
uh, I just it becomes the question whether the municipalities will say, well, we're not going to put any funding there. Let's the government's going to do it. So that's it's going to cost us probably a, a lot more money, and we have to look at that going mm -hmm. forward. Leader of the opposition. Okay. Thanks, Chair. And, uh, and that's one of the areas of, of amendment that I hope clarifies that. And, and you're right, it's going to cost money somewhere. It's going to and cost either money. we have to give the municipalities enough resources to carry that out themselves, or the province has to accept that we are going to have jurisdiction in a municipality without um, a particular yeah. dog bylaw. Um, I want to move on to potatoes for a minute now. And I'm wondering whether the province has any. Uh, has had any issues with bacterial ring rot recently on potatoes? Has that been an issue? Uh, we had uh, some outbreaks of bacteria ring rots uh, last last fall. Um, I th they have it under. Con they seem to have it contained now, and uh, hopefully, we've had no new cases uh, reported. Leader of the opposition, glad to hear that. So, are the costs of dealing with that are they budgeted and covered w within the department? Uh, Mary, do you have those numbers? Um, hmm. Bacteria ring rot is a. I'd have to come back to you with with how that's covered between the, us and mm -hmm. the insurance corporation. Yeah. Come the back opposition. Back. Okay. To another bacterial, uh, another potato disease, oh. rather potato wart, and we know last December. Uh, there were a couple of fields in Queen's County where CFIA uh, discovered the spores. They didn't actually find any potatoes themselves, but they found the spores. Um, and the border was shut to exports of seed potatoes, which was potentially, I think back in 2000, it could cost over $20 million for the, yeah. the, the seed potato export industry here in PEI. Um, I'm sure that it won't be as, uh, as devastating this time. And I believe that the recently the border was reopened yes it was but i'm wondering and that's great but of course opening the border doesn't mean that those seed potatoes will actually make their way to market and that this is the states we're talking about um is there any indication as to whether the seed potato growers here are able to market their product in the states now that the border is open uh um yes uh, i believe they are um and I'm not sure about the infected farms, but other farms are able to. Um, and anyone that isn't, um, is affected by the potato wart is eligible for the BRMM program. So hopefully they, which will cover their market losses if there is any. The business risk management programs. Leader of the opposition. So given that, you know, there were no potato infected potatoes ever found, and I think they went back to the same area and couldn't find the spores, it's, I mean, it's just a very weird it was, situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. rather than these, you know, high quality PEI seed potatoes get thrown away and, and the farmers being compensated, are there any other markets, and this is the states, of course, is, is the problem here, but are there alternate markets where these seed potatoes could actually be sold so these farmers can make a profit rather than just be compensated for their losses? Yeah, it's still early to uh, determine that, but uh, uh, there there is other markets and uh, they will be able to move their potatoes, I assume. Um, um, but we will we will monitor it as as we go along, and uh, I, I don't expect uh, uh, t I don't expect it to be affect our seed guys too hardly too too drastically. But uh, but that's that's with our conversations we've had with the the potato board. There is some concern, but it's not uh, not a great concern right now. Leader of the opposition. Okay, I'm, uh, that gives me some comfort. A uh, number of seed potato growers in my immediate vicinity, my next door neighbor is one of them. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic that they're they're actually going to find markets for these potatoes. Mm -hmm. Final part on this section for me, and it's to do with the development of regulations for the organic product certification. We're one of the few provinces that does not have um, organic product certification, and I'm wondering when those regulations are going to be introduced. I think you'll have to ask the person beside you. Right. <laughs> I think we're waiting uh, for the uh, the committee, uh, organic uh, committee, to bring the bring us some recommendations to make those. We are 
looking forward to making them, and uh, but I think we're waiting for the committee to come with a proposal that uh, from the Organic Association. Leader of the opposition. I'm good, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Good time okay. to pass Shall it over to my Carey. Soil and Feed Lab. Appropriations provided for the operation of Soil and Feed Laboratory. Administration, 52,000. <coughs> Equipment, 11,100. Material Supplies and Services, 160,600. Professional Services, 28,400. Salary, 724,400. Travel and Training, 2,600. Total Soil and Feed Lab, 979,100. Shall the section carry? Carry. Dairy and Plant Diagnostics Lab. Appropriations provided for the operation of the Dairy Lab and Plant Diagnostics Lab. Administration, 75,400. Equipment, 2,900. Material Supplies and Services, 220,100. Professional Services, 2,500. Salaries, 390,500. Travel and Training, 8,200. Total Dairy and Plant Diagnostics Lab, 699,600. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so, Minister, on this section, I do have to ask about um, butter. I, like, I, like you see a lot hashtag Buttergate, the hardness of the butter. Oh, I do butter. know, right? Okay. <laughs> it's the it's the strangest thing for me to be asking about the legislature, but I do think people are interested in what's going on, and if there is a difference. And I know that our butter's been sent to Guelph to be tested. So, can you kind of? <laughs> Tell us what you know about it. So the, it's it's um, well the power of social media I guess is is what I would say is where I the butter the people are trying to blame the palm palm fats that are fed to uh, cows but um, and. I don't know if there might be a link to it, but um, I, I don't know if recently the University of Guelph did a study on 17 different varieties and they couldn't link it to palm fats. Uh, yeah, the texture might be a little different. Uh, it's probably what we're, possibly could be what we're feeding the cows, um, but I, we've been feeding palm fats to cows for over 10 years and all of a sudden the butter changes this year. I, I don't know, it's it's obviously, the cow's stomach is a complicated uh, <laughs> rumen and uh, what the fats come out is, I'll, I'll leave up to the scientists to figure out why, uh, but uh, I can tell you, butter hasn't changed in taste and uh, some people like it that it's a little firmer and doesn't melt on uh, room temperature, so. <laughs> uh, I'll take the good on over the bad. So. Stratford. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for that, Mr. I can't say myself that I've noticed a difference, but I do know there's a professor over at Dell University, right, who has uh, been talking about this a lot, and if Guelph is also opening. So um, I don't even understand it, <laughs> to be honest. Like, And uh, is, like, is there a concern with the department of the food trust or anything like that and what's surrounding this um, through the dairy, research that's being done? The dairy farmers of PEI are very concerned about the food trust and Dairy Farmers Canada have put out a campaign to uh, ensure that uh, the public trust is still with, um, still with butter and will continue to be. Um, the gentleman that started this, the professor from Dalhousie, is uh, very out outspoken about the Canadian dairy industry. He's he's uh, quite um, outspoken uh, being against supply management in the dairy industry, and he seems to like to uh, to take any shots at supply managed uh, dairy industry in Canada every chance he gets and. Uh, I can tell you as an uh, alumni of Dalhousie University, I'm a little <laughs> disappointed, but um, whether he, he, he started this and uh, he, if he accomplished if he wanted to, to uh, damage the dairy industry, he's, he's, trying his, he's trying his best, but that's all I can say about that. Okay. Where are we Stratford? Thank you, Chair, and I can appreciate that because I don't have the background, right? And I, I mean, I do know that you're an alumni from the um, 
from Dell, the agricultural school. So I, I do appreciate that. And I mean, I can assume that the industry here in PEI is concerned about what's going on and, and uh, our, you know, like farm food care does a great job in, in, you know, developing public trust in our food system and we want to maintain that. But, you know, if, if there is, um, anyway, it'd be interesting to see what happens with the Guelph testing, especially because I guess the ADL is sent up Mm -hmm. um, product to be tested, so it'll be interesting interesting it's to see what they come up with. I think that that would be good for the industry as a whole, right, to clear up some things. So I appreciate your candor. I was legitimately okay. interested <laughs> in where we stood here in, a prov in the province, and I appreciate that. I have no further questions. Thank okay. you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Yeah. Total Animal Health Regulatory and Analytic Labs, 5,012,700. Shall it carry? Carry. Land Division, Land Administration, appropriations provided for the management and support of Land Division, Administration, 55,000, Equipment, 4,700, Materials and Supplies, 11,900, Professional Services, 12,300, Salaries, 179,000, Travel and Training, 20,700, Total Land Administration, 283,600. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Minister, I put a, submitted a written question on the Land Matters uh, project plan requesting what the timelines, the dates are for all the specific sections. Do you have that identified? Can you provide that to us today? Uh, could you repeat? What, what did you ask for? Sure. So the Land Matters PEI project plan, yes. which was tabled in the House, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, didn't have any dates associated with it. Right. And I'd submitted a written question on that to have the dates identified for all of the specific sections. Okay. Um, do you have those dates today to provide to me? I don't, but we'll make sure you get them. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Is that something that you can bring back tomorrow? Because I, my, I know you've said that. If I'm still on the generally. floor, sure. What's that? If I'm still on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a challenge? <laughs> Um, so more of a joke. <laughs> if you could bring that back, because uh, I think that that's important. I mean, you seem to know it off the top of your head, because any time that I've asked you questions on it, you're like, oh, that'll come in the next sitting, or the yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, I've heard that, right? right? Like, yeah. I'm just going to point out that the first time we talked about this was September 2019 for changes in, in the Lands Protection Act and Planning Act. There was supposed to be public consultation in 2020. Um, winter of 2020, we're supposed to see um, legislation in the spring of 2020. I get it, COVID, I get it, you've called this. If things are moving along very nicely now. I get that. Things are I would just love finally on track. to put those dates on a piece of paper from the minister so that I can All see right. when to expect I already had to apologize for missing dates in the legislature. The day, well, that's so. no reason not to put them on the piece of paper, minister. That holds you All accountable. Right. I'll, give you, I'll give you what you want. Mermaid right. Stratford. Thank you. Chair, um, Minister, did the did the recent Iraq transaction, or sorry, the, on the uh, the land transaction investigation, incur any costs to the province? I don't know if it's in this budget. Is it? Uh, at this point, I haven't paid any bills against that. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mary. So not even against it for last year or anything like that? Any we, interim payments? We, or did we, we, did, we did receive a bill, uh, but we sent it back for need to be broken down a little more than it was. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Can you share at the House what the bill was? It's over 70000 70? Mermaid Stratford. Okay. 70 Thank plus. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And... Uh, I think <coughs> provincial planning section, and I'll talk about the land matters in a different section. That's all the questions I have under this section. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. Right. Inspection services. Appropriations provided for the operation of inspection services, including electrical, boiler, liquefied petroleum, gas, and plumbing, elevators, lifts, and amusement rides, building codes, petroleum storage tanks, and ozone layer protection. Administration, 28,300. Equipment, 20,000. Material supplies and services, 90,800. Professional services, 20,000. Salaries, 2,250,300. Travel and training, 157,000. Total inspection services, 2,566,400. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you. 
Um, under this section, there's there's a significant jump on a jump for salaries. Can you tell me what that is being spent on? This is the second phase of the implementation of the National Building Code for uh, residential. So there are some new positions attached to this. There's four. Um, this is based on um, uh, an estimate of about 800 were, uh, residential uh, building and occupancy uh, permits that we're expecting annually. So the additional staff is a gas inspector. Um, so presently there's, currently there's two gas inspectors mainly for commercial. So, so now we'll have three gas inspectors and they'll be trained in both commercial and residential. Uh, electrical inspector, um, a building of, is official, um, that person inspects buildings, um, and a compliance officer, which is new, and uh, that is a position to uh, ensure complaints are properly responded to and deal with uh, non-compliance issues. Mary Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mary. Um, so with the increase in the, the uh, the FTEs within this section, Do, can we expect to see an increase in inspections? Is that what the intent is? Definitely, yes. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. I'm going to go back to data and analysis. So, do you have um, do you have performance measurements of what you're trying to achieve for inspections? And um, was this based on the fact that you had under inspected prior to this, and that now, or is it just because of the new building code? Like. It's because of the new building yeah. code, yeah. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, did COVID prevent the inspections of any facilities? I, I don't think so. I don't believe so. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Um, I believe in the, I have the briefing book for October of 2020, and in that it stated that the, um, that there were facilities that were not able to be um, inspected and uh, community care facilities were part of that. Is that something that you're aware with, aware about, or aware of? Sorry. Um, I wasn't aware. Oh, uh, well, the, the boiler inspections still happened um, in long-term care, so I'm not sure what inspections. We would, other than building expect inspections. Mermaid Stratford. Just trying to find a page here. Are community care facilities something that are um, inspected under the Department of Agriculture and Land? I don't. Know. I'd have to <laughs> go back and check. I, I don't know. I'll have to find out. Be able to put my finger on here. Mayor Stratford, while you're doing that, I'm going to jump to someone else and I'll come back that. to you. Thank you. So, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. For the gas inspectors, you said there was commercial and uh, residential. Could you give me an example of the commercial? Like, is that, are those new hires or is this, has it always been there? They're there. They're new. What, what's the leader of the third party? Commercial gas inspector. So, that would be your propane installations. And uh, we found it was a real. Uh, a gap that we needed to fill um, before we had <laughs> okay. danger. So something. it doesn't have anything to do with highway vehicles or anything that it's a different department? Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the building code. So if I apply for a permit today to build a home and it gets approved this week, but I can't start it till after the code comes in and my grandfathered in after the, what's the date? 31st. March 31st? Yeah. So anything after that? Falls under the code if something started the day before it doesn't, or how does that work? <laughs> I'm not going to give an answer on that because I'm not 100% sure. But I, 31st is the date. Uh, I think if you get the permit before that, you're yeah. So I think it's when you get your permit. When you get your permit. Thank Third you. Third party. That's good, Jared. Thanks. You're welcome. Charles on Brighton. Um, as to the cost of a building permit, has it or will it go up as a result of the uh, building code? It has gone up. Yes. So, Charlotte and Brighton? So is it based on a percentage of the cost of the building? Square, like square footage. Square footage. Okay. Charlotte and Brighton? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the income from that presumably is reflected somewhere else in the budget, not, not within uh, the section. 
It's within the it's within the revenue piece. Yeah, You're looking yeah. at the expenditure side right here. It, revenues on the revenue side of the budget. So um, the, the building uh, revenue is um, under. Oh, it should be here under the revenues. So. Building permit applications. Yes, is, it, it's found in this. The revenue is on this account. And it's expected to increase by about a million dollars. Cheryl, that Brighton. Okay, thank you. So the overall cost isn't necessarily That's right. going to go up. It's going to be carried by the uh, where we're building the buildings. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Cheryl, that Brighton. Um, I just want to comment on community care facilities would would be inspected among other things with, by building inspectors, but also with a whole slew of other inspectors, in my experience. That's just a comment to the question. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, oh, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Okay. Provincial planning appropriations provided for the Administration of Land Planning, Land Protections Act regulations, and subdivision approvals, development and control. Administration, 12,900. Equipment, 2,500. Materials and supplies, 3,700. Professional services, 325,000. Salaries, 1,003,900. Travel and training, 29,400. Total provincial planning, 1,377,400. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, can you tell us how many, and I'm going to say certified professional planners, so ones that actually qualify under the new um, enacted legislation, how many certified professional planners that are recognized through the Institute does the department have on staff? I, our department has two, I believe. And Mary Strack, oh sorry. Mary, do you want to? I'd have to bring that back to make sure I, me I meet your qualifications, if that's okay. I would appreciate okay. that, yeah. yes. Mary Strafford. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I've gone through some of the land matters PEI presentations, and one of them, which was from the PEI Potato Board, they had referenced um, proposed amendments, and these are not a bit proposed amendments that I have seen. So presumably, um, we might be talking about the consultation draft that should have gone out to the public in the winter of 2020. Um, are you, was there a consultation draft that was provided to stakeholders that was not provided to opposition parties or the public? Not that I'm aware of. No. Mermaid Stratford. So what proposed um, amendments would the PEI Potato Board be referring to? They talk about not-for-profit, they talk about um, uh, interlocking companies in that presentation that they did for Land Matters PEI. Do you know what they're um, talking about then? I don't. I haven't seen their presentations. So, no. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So, Minister, was there a consultation draft of the Planning Act or the Lands Protection Act in that was a, that was completed by planners? within the department back in early 2020 that was not put forward um, and no, no decisions made on? Not that I'm aware of. Mermaid Stratford? The Planning Act, there is some suggested regulation changes, but, uh, um, but nothing, no. Mermaid Stratford? Um, I'm going to touch on uh, one scenario. So like private roads, for instance, and when we have a lot of building permits that are approved um, so that lots of development are happening, developments happening on private roads, and we see those um, roads being used more and more frequently because more and more people are actually winterizing them and living in them year-round, and they're not actually passable. Um, have you been contacted by members of the public that are dealing with issues, especially around safety, public safety, um, where they're concerned that ambulances and fire trucks and that kind of thing cannot access them? Yeah, no, we've constantly um, 
get some requests or people that want to turn their private road into a public road and that's a matter that goes to transportation and innovation so mm -hmm. that's not Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So, and I recognize that private roads are private roads, public roads are public roads, and that, you know, it's a very difficult process, I believe, to go through um, getting a private road change to a public road. Um, but as the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, there must be concerns of people being able to get uh, adequate health care, first response, um, res uh, um, sorry, for first responders there. I'm an agriculture minister. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention. I was looking to see the time. <laughs> we're at four o'clock. We're going to switch over, but just uh, heads up. Yeah. So and I'm coming at this from a land perspective because we are actually approving permits right on private roads, allowing construction to continue happening. But is there, like, when you are dealing with planning, you also have to take into a lot of other things, a lot of con uh, into consideration. Transportation a lot of deals things. with like we we can approve a lot or uh, subdivide a lot, but it has to go to transportation. They approve the right of ways. That doesn't come in my department. Where we suffer? So you can get a lot, or you can't get a lot unless you have a right away, and that's that comes from TI. Okay, um, I know we're going to be switching here in a yeah. second. So I guess the other question that I would have along this would be: my understanding is that there was proposed amendments um, around okay. the. Uh, on private property, like duplexes, or private roadways, like duplexes and that kind of thing, in order to do, put in, like, grant um, in-law suites or granny suites or that kind of thing. Are you familiar with any of those proposed amendments that came from your land division? Mermaid Stratford? So if there are proposals for legislation, how does that get to the floor of the House if it's not going through the Minister of Agriculture and Land, if, the, if your department is putting forward? My understanding is that there was... Um, well, my director hasn't brought it to, to my deputy now yet, so I guess we'll, when she does, we will. Okay. Mermaid Stratford? Do you want to switch? I'm Pardon okay. me? I, I'm okay. Okay. So... Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. carry. Committee of the whole house having under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and beg to leave to sit again. I move to report the committee be adopted. Shall carry. <clears throat> the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Bill 100 be now read. Shall it carry? Order number 20, Election Age Act, Bill number 100, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that the um, House resolve itself into no. Second. Oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the bill be read now a second time. Charlotte Carey? Election Age Act, Bill Number 100, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that the um, this House now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to... Um, to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? 
Okay. When? The Honourable Member from Tignes, Pomero, Deputy Speaker, to chair the Committee of the Whole House, please. Now, the committee of the whole house to take into consideration a bill to be in titulled in sorry, Election Age Act. Um, a request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be requested? Shall it be <laughs> 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 yeah. granted? granted. Please state your name and position for Hansford, please. Sure. I'm Nathan Hood. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor to the Official Opposition. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, Promoter, would you like to begin with this general statement on the bill's intent? Sure. Um, so I'm happy to be here to debate uh, the Election Age Act today. Uh, Mr. Chair, since the last time this bill was brought to the floor, we've engaged in further consultation, including with the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate and their Child and Youth Advisory Committee, the Federation of PEI Municipalities, uh, Commission Scolaire Langue Française, the Public Schools Branch, Young Voters of PEI, Student Councils from across the province, PEI Coalition for Women in Government, Olnoué, Native Council of PEI, various individual youth and all members of the House on three different occasions. Uh, we felt the consultation process was constructive and useful. We heard positive feedback on how this would benefit young islanders, the considerations to address education and logistical matters in the rollout of lo lowering the age. Our consultation on this bill has solidified my belief that in matters respecting children and youth, the Legislative Assembly and Government have an obligation to consider and ensure that the best interests of the child are reflected. In fact, in Article 3 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it quotes, uh, I'll quote, uh, in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social wel welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities, or legislative bodies, the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration, end quote. UNICEF Canada, in a submission to Parliament on lowering the voting age to 16, wrote, and I quote again, as young people don't currently have the vote in Canada, they have little to no ability to influence decisions being made by elected politicians that affect them today and into the future. Issues of concern to or about children and youth rarely feature in political campaigns as those seeking political office aren't necessarily attuned to address issues that have no voice and constituencies who can't vote them into office. 
The inability to influence their elected representatives is a major reason why children's rights are not afforded the priority consideration they are due. Political representatives are obligated to respect, protect, and fulfill children's rights regardless of whether or not young people have the power to vote them into office. However, if political representatives wish to advance the best interests of children, of the child, excuse me, they would come to the conclusion that giving 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote is indeed in their best interests, end quote. My caucus believes that lowering the voting age is an important step in ensuring the rights of the child are addressed by politicians and governments, and we are happy to resume the debate on this important initiative. Thank you. You're very welcome. Is the pleasure of the committee that bill be now read clause by clause or just open it up to questions? Up to questions. Okay. A Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to the promoter for bringing the bill forward. Um, I think it... Um, is something that we do need to have discussion with and have a conversation about. But I am, con I do have concerns. Some concerns. Um, you stated that you consulted with the Federation of PI Municipalities. My question is, why would you not also consult with the Municipal Affairs Department of the uh, Fisheries and Communities? Uh, well, actually, um, this the, the, the list that we used to consult was based on the motion that was tabled but not debated in the House. Uh, we used that as kind of a starting point and went off in various different places. But what's really important to note here is that um, when, we are, when we're bringing forward legislation, it's important that we kind of give weight to the people that it impacts the most. And so based on one of the requests from the Federation of Municipalities was that there be um, further study done into this. And um, one of the, whenever I stated I had sent three emails around um, and I included different um, pieces of information with that. And one of them I, I included was uh, UNICEF Canada submission for electoral reform where it has done an extensive study on on this. And so what we're looking at is the impacts that this has on youth. Um, after doing consultations with the chief electoral officer and all of those things, we're looking at roughly 3,000 to 5,000 new voters here. And they're spread out all across the island. And so based on the consultation that, um, that was done, um, we... Uh, that's kind of where we are today. If there's anything that you wanted to add in, um, and I think, I, yeah, just quickly, I think we had sent an email to all MLAs as well, including ministers. About yeah. So one of the emails that I sent was I shared all of the consultation materials that I was using and and encouraged MLAs if there was anyone that was missed on the list or if they had any concerns to bring them forward. I, I did hear concerns from from two MLAs, but this was not one of the concerns that we heard. Minister Chair. of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, Honorable Member. Uh, Referring back to the letter dated the 24th of February 2021 from the Federation Municipalities, can you explain to me how you um, you engaged the Federation? Uh, we engaged the Federation the same way that we engaged everyone else. And um, we, so we sent some questions and also sent, and, and, and keeping in mind that this was a very limited scope, we were asking how it would impact their organization, um, to which they responded, which, which we appreciate. I do have the letter here. And um, so uh, we asked them the questions and we also said if there was anything else that they would like to add, um, which they, they, their letter, as you can see, it's here somewhere, was was very extensive and they offered, um, they did offer a lot of points, which we appreciate. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Chair. Well, referring to the letter, my understanding is that an email was sent um, from the opposition to the Federation um, asking for their comments or thoughts. And that was to the extent. There was no direct conversation with the Federation. We have 59 municipalities across the island which fall under the Municipal Governments Act. And according to Section 9 of the Municipal Governments Act, um, any, any change, drastic change, I'm going to call it, or any, any manner of that would uh, require direct consultation with the municipalities and direct conversation with the Federation. Um, and I believe that also that there should be conversation with the Municipal Department, Municipal Affairs Department, which did not happen. 
but in paragraph three of the letter dated the 24th of 2021 to yourself, I want to quote, changing the voting age is a significant reform to the election process in PEI. Such a, fund, such a fun, fundamental shift should only occur, occur following a thorough examination of the implications of the change and broad consultation. So with that, did you consult with any of the 59 municipalities across the island? Well, uh, two parts to that, Minister. With all due respect, um, the three emails that I sent dated January 5th, January 26th, and February 18th, I, I, I have to say that, you know, this that provided an ample opportunity for these to come forward. You did send me an email asking if I consulted with Federation of, of Municipalities, which I responded that we did. It would have been nice to have this before so that we could have had this discussion and not wasted the time in the House on that. Um, and so, and just to kind of um, to kind of reel that back in, this is this is um, yes, it is a change to the way in which to, it's an electoral reform, and this also goes back. I'd like to take this back to the children's rights lens. Um, we set the original age of voting. You know, we was 21 at one time, and then it was 18. And so the United Nations on the Conventions of the Rights of the Child, which I would like to also draw our attention to the fact that they are the only experts on on. On, uh, the rights of the child. Um, they say that as our understanding, as uh, as time goes on and and data changes and re and research changes, you know, uh, dates so limits on ages are put in place to reduce harms. And so, as our knowledge changes, so then should the ages. So you know, looking at at something like vaping or smoking. You know, there's no that's that's in a whole different realm because it, there are harms associated with it. When we're talking about extending the franchise to another group, um, the data, the research, the evidence has changed, and indeed, um, you know, this after consulting with the chief electoral office and and. Um, you know, and considering the impacts it would have. I know I had a discussion with um, with Philip Brown, the mayor of Charlottetown, on this as well. And uh, so, so yeah, that's how... Is there anything that you would add to that? Yeah, the one thing I would add is around the concern that it's a significant change to the election process, I would disagree with that because we are just simply changing the age at which you're qualified to vote. There's nothing fundamental about the election process, the nomination process, the course of the election, none of that is changing. We're just simply amending who is eligible to vote in an election. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I would disagree with that statement. Um, from what I've read in the bill and from what the Federation is telling me, what municipalities are telling me, and from what my own staff in municipal affairs are telling me, that changing the act by which persons can participate in municipal elections would be a considerable and substantial change in amendment. This also affects three different amendments, or make three amendments to the Municipal Governments Act. One being the eligibility of electors under the MGA 31-2B, the qualification of candidates under MGA 33-1A, and also the qualification of resort municipality candidates, section 33-4A. So I'm wondering if we're, if we're making changes to this one, this one part of the bill, or the original bill, why would we not consult with municipal affairs on, on the effect that it's going to have directly on them three sections that I quoted? Um, Minister, my understanding is that the way the bill is drafted, the eligibility to stand as a candidate flows from the eligibility to vote in an election. And so the reason why there are changes to the sections that deal with being a candidate in an election is because we're changing those sections that deal with the ability to vote. And because we're doing two separate ages, there was an amendment required to those sections to ensure that that new 16 age to vote was not, in fact, the age to be a candidate. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thanks, Chair. Um, understanding that, um, the feedback that I've that I've also received from municipal election uh, provisions tends to emphasize opposition uh, to further complex administration and operation requirements of the MGA elections and the by-election. 
and by changing the voting age in municipal elections, this may be perceived as an increase in its complexity. So the question being is, is this something you have considered? Can you? Sorry. sorry, what exactly is it that you're asking have we considered? Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Chair. So feedback from municipal election provisions tends to emphasize opposition to further complex administration and operation requirements of the MGA elections and by-elections. Changing the voting age in municipal elections may be perceived as increasing this complexity. So the question is, is this something that you have considered? What you're causing is a ripple effect, could have a ripple effect into municipal elections and by-elections across the province, affecting 59 municipalities. So is this is something you have considered? Well, I suppose the, the effect of the bill, yes, we've considered that it will have impacts because the intent is to lower the voting age to 16. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. I don't like the word suppose. I think, I think it, it, it brings in the fact that we have a change that you're proposing, and I'm not saying I'm against it, but I'm saying that there is considerable consideration that needs to be placed um, with municipal affairs or with municipalities and what the effect it could have on them. So from what I'm hearing, you're not, are you sure or are you not sure? Are you sure or you're not sure of the effect that this will cause on municipal elections across the whole province? Well, we're, we're, not, we're certainly not disputing that there'd be an effect on municipal elections because Again, the, the intent of the bill is to have an effect. It's to expand who is eligible to vote in those elections. Um, do I think it's going to, you know, significantly change how elections are conducted? No, because we're simply expanding who's eligible to vote. And communities, I think, are always in flux. Um, you know, we've seen lots of population growth in our province, and that certainly can have significant impacts on municipalities because now they have to register these new voters in their municipalities. Um, and I think in some ways this is just a similar thing where this, the, the electoral base in the municipality is growing and they would be registered to vote in the same way that voters are registered currently. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you. So you've acknowledged, you've acknowledged that there will be an impact on municipal elections or ripple effect as it applies to the MGA and down to 59 municipalities. So would you not think it would be important or prudent to have direct conversations with staff at Municipal Affairs and direct conversations with the Federation of Municipalities and possibly invite the municipalities in or the mayors and CAOs of the municipalities to have a direct conversation on this impact or what they could be looking for? Uh, again, I would, you know, that motion was put on the table before uh, we went that said to send it to committee. And I, I wish that we would have, that you would have taken advantage of that because it would have, at this point in time, it just feels like so much time has been wasted. And, um, you know, of course there are going to be impacts. That is what the legislation is, that's just a natural consequence of the legislation. Um, I just, you know, at this point in time, um, there's a, it is of our understanding that, you know, this isn't something that, this is something that's been looked at, um, specifically not that, that specific of an issue, but it's something that has been looked at about how it does affect um, voting and, and, you know, at this stage, there's nothing really that suggests to us that it's going to have a negative impact on municipalities. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thanks, Chair. Um, one, one other question that, that's been raised by, the, it's, um, one other concern that's, that's been brought before, before me is, of course, we're talking about changes and the effect it would have on municipalities and municipal governments act. But I'm also very curious with my previous occupation, have we taken into consideration what effect this would have on the youth, the youth criminal justice act? And I would have to ask, you know, the minister of justice, um, 
would, you know, was his department involved or, or do we have any conversations with that? Because, you know, there, there would be an effect there possibly too. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because that is a, a question that a lot of people raise. And I, I think the, the member addressed it somewhat in her opening remarks where when we set ages for different things, especially with respect to youth, we're often setting them so that we can protect youth from harm. And so when we set an age at 18, it's because we don't want young people to face, you know, the same consequences as an adult would face because we know from research that younger people have better odds for rehabilitation, that a criminal record can have profound impacts on the course of their life. And it's desirable to make sure that we avoid those circumstances and, and derail young people's lives. With respect to lowering the voting age, we don't have that same concern of harm. And in fact, we're actually trying to expand their rights so that they're able to more fully participate in their communities and their democracies to ensure that their, their um, voice is heard. And so in fact, it's actually to benefit young people. Um, but that, I, I really think the, the important thing is to look at it through the, the context of that harm and, and why we would set an age at, at any particular uh, place. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thanks, Chair. Um, I guess I'm, it, I'm not voting for this, this, this bill. Um, and on the sole purpose of this, and I would caution the House, um, I believe that the changes that this will cause, that we need to have direct consultation with members of municipal affairs, with the Federation of municipal PEI municipalities, and possibly the 59 municipalities. I will offer, as the minister responsible for municipal affairs, to assist in them conversations or have further consultation. But I do not believe that the bill as presented has had thorough enough consultation across the province on the ramifications or what it could cause um, as it you know, applies to the Municipal Government Act and our 59 municipalities. And um, I, I would I, yeah, I appreciate that, and I really wish that um, you would have extended the, the courtesy of, of sending this to us sooner so we're not just con continuing to kick this down the road even even longer. With all due respect, Minister. Chair. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you. I'll go back in time. A few years ago, I was a successful member in this House and brought forward three private member bills in a complete majority government and had them passed. And one thing I learned as a promoter of the bills is that one must make sure that we do everything we can to engage all parties involved or that might have an impact. That was done on the highway traffic bill, that was done on the sexual, uh, sexual assault training bill for judges, and that was also done on the total PST bill. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Cornwall Meadowbank. So I was just actually trying to find the UNICEF. You called it a study. Do you have a copy of the study? Because this, this I did. Oh, sorry. Lisa Wolf, uh, there's a submission, but there's nothing as far as analytics of children regarding decision-making, growth, all that kind of stuff. So I just kind of wonder where the science is coming from based on the submission by UNICEF. Thank you for that. Um, so the, what I sent around to all members was the submission. And if, if you were to look up uh, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, that's where you'll find, um, I, I, can't, I, I can't reference the, the sections, I don't know it that well, but where it talks about capacity and intelligence and maturity and how that changes with what that changes with time. Like back in the 80s, the, the, the research that we had suggested that no lower than 18. Now based on the work of several different, and, and I'm happy to share those with you, but several different um, people and organizations, it's now said that the, the, the brain capacity, the political engagement is ideal at 16, and, and uh, 
UNICEF has come out to say there's no protective factors, um, sorry, there's no protective benefit from keeping 16-year-olds from the vote. Um, I was going to say one more thing. Uh, it's left me for now. It might come back I, to me. I guess. Charlotte, uh, sorry, Cornwall Meadowbank. To me, if I had a head, you know, if I had to uh, likely indulge myself in the Convention of Rights of, of Children I, and have those statistical stuff in front of me, I might. But when I looked that up, and it was done in 2016, I believe, was a submission. Um, and as you said in your opening remarks, how things are changing rapidly, relevance to children, it might be easier sell for you to have us engaged in that, all that broad information that, that's not here. But there's something else that, and this is beyond this issue, and this is beyond Prince Edward Island, but the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, and I know, I think I've seen something today where Elizabeth May is actually promoting voting at age 16 and what have you. Um, but have you had any legal opinions for uh, a charter lawyer to take a look at that to see if this is, is this appropriate? Like, is this legal for us to do that as a legislative assembly? Forget about rightly or wrongly as whoever votes whatever way they vote, but I'm just wondering what your process was to come to this. Sure. So I can address a little bit of, of some of the case law, perhaps, and that might be helpful for understanding how we've... Because it, it's interesting to look at the, the history of the, the voting age in Canada and in the provinces, because we saw it go from 22 to 18 to, to 16, and there weren't really any court challenges. And there was a court challenge in Alberta, I believe it was, in the 2000s. And it was a group of 15 and... 16-year-olds uh, who were looking to have the ability to vote, and because of their age, they wouldn't have that ability by the time the election came around. And these were young people who were noted by the court as being very engaged in their, their communities. And what the court said was that under the Charter, Canadians have the right to vote um, and to stand as candidates in uh, provincial and federal elections, but there can be a reasonable restriction on that right. And the example they used was that if you think of a newborn baby as an example, a newborn baby is not capable of voting. Um, so there has to be a, lawn, a line drawn somewhere uh, to say this is where this right starts, and that's considered reasonable and justifiable in our society. At that time, we did not have a lot of scholarship on adolescent intellectual development. Um, I'm not even sure, I, I mean, I think it might have actually predated the convention, if I'm not mistaken, the research they were citing in, in that court case. But since that court case, we have seen a big expansion in the, the research that's available on adolescent development. And we've actually seen different countries around the world adopt a voting age of 16 and 17. So not only are we able to assess the intellectual capacity of, of young voters, we're also now able to see what does it look like when they participate in elections. And as the UNICEF report kind of points out, you know, the science says they have the mental capacity to, to vote. And when they do vote, there's no, you know, crazy harms that are arising in elections. There's no funny results. Um, in fact, one of, one of the examples they cite is Scotland, where 16- and 17-year-olds who were able to vote in an election were actually the demographic that was the most likely to consume different or multiple sources of, of information when determining who they should vote for, which would suggest, in fact, that they're actually more engaged in trying to inform themselves on the voting process. Um, so, that's, so the question here is really, what would be a reasonable limit on the... Uh, on that right to, to vote. And I think given the development of, of the academic literature, it would certainly suggest that it's 16. And I think seeing examples from around the world where there's no harm arising to society from, from that participation would suggest that 16 would be a, a reasonable age. And, and I'd like to add a couple of things to that too. Um, in the UNICEF document, it does reference um, uh, capacities. Um, just 
in case, um, I, I don't know if there's something more, we can talk about that after if there's something more that, that you needed from that. There was also another document by Children First Canada that was a, a nationwide consultation done with youth. And as we consider who, you know, when, when something's being impacted, I think that this deserves a lot of weight um, in terms of the, the people that it impacts is directly our youth. And so this was done between March and April of 2020. And it was nationwide conversation where they talked about all of these things that we're talking about. I was quite impressed with what they, some of the things that they talked about. But there are three recommendations um, from the consultation was, was really interesting to me and also led me back to what I was hearing from youth. And so their three recommendations were after much discussion and evolution of conversation was to lower the voting age to 16, to increase education for young people on political rights and responsibilities. And then this one I found the most interesting, educate adults to help reduce stigma that youth aren't capable of voting. Um, you know, this, I think that it doesn't, it, it's not hard to find the information supporting that. And if, and it, I encourage anyone if in this document, there's, there's tons of references in the back that you could, that you could look to, um, to find, to find that supporting evidence. And, and, you know, as we consider an organization like UNICEF, um, I, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't argue with, with them in terms of their, um, their knowledge and their, you know, their, their work. Um, and with that, okay, all right, okay. Um, Cornwall Medivac. So I guess my, my specific question was, was there any constitutional experts consulted on this regarding the Canadian Charter Rights? But I'm going to leave that for a second. I want to read something that, if you can indulge me. Uh, sure. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll read it. So under Section 3 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a section that constitutionally guarantees Canadian citizens the democratic right to vote in a general, federal, or provincial election and the right to be eligible for membership in the House of Commons or a provincial legislative assembly subject to the requirements of Section 1 of the Charter. Federal judges, prisoners, and those mental institutions have gained the franchise as a result of this provision whereas the restriction on minors voting was found to be permissible due to Section 1. I'm going to read Section 1, and you guys interpret, you can tell me what you interpret out of this, and this is why I'm raising this. I've had queries on previous life on Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, and I found it rather interesting. So, Section 1 of the Charter Rights and Freedoms allows governments to implement the 18-year-old threshold. Question begs, does Section 1 allow for government to alter the age to lower than 18 years. Section two, or number two, section three of the charter says that citizens who are eligible to vote for provincial elections also has the right to run for membership is the le in the legislative assembly. Therefore, the question begs, if we lower the age to 16, are we challenged through, the, through this to not allow to someone at 16 years of age to run for one of our seats. Number three, is it even constitutional to permit people the right to vote while not allowing them the right to stand for election or is the breach of section three of charter rights and freedoms? So I guess that's why I came back to the constitutional experts. This is a lot bigger than us debating whether we agree with 16 year olds to vote. This takes us to another level. We're not debating that though. So, so, if I could indulge a little further, I guess for my reading this and understanding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, how can we be certain that this legislation is in fact constitutional, first of all, if we have not provided with any professional opinions, legal or constitutional experts, what have you, besides reading reports from organizations? Like, I don't want to be the legislative of the country that passes something and someone in Ottawa says, what's going on? Why did they do that? Until we have our I's dotted and T's crossed. I'm not saying I'm against this. I'm just saying, let's get it. If we're going to do it, let's get it right. And I think that's, there's something there for that. I mean, this is not clear to me. 
and obviously not to anybody else to some extent. So that's why I asked, where's our expert opinion on constitutional rights? And if we make this change, because I've heard you say before that you would not want to see a 16-year-old vote or uh, run for a legislative assembly position. So if we're doing this and we're saying, yes, they can run or they should be allowed or it's their constitutional right to run, then I, your opinion either changed or we should stop this maybe and get a real opinion. Uh, well, would, would you like to? Well, uh, maybe I could start and then you could. Um, I'm going to go here again with all due respect. I sent an email January 5th. I sent an email January 26th. And I sent an email February 18th asking for any concerns. And I really, really was disappointed to not hear anything back because my biggest concern would be that these were not addressed. And I was perfectly willing to make them apart, make them public and talk about it on the floor, um, but that we wouldn't waste more time doing this. With all due respect, this is important and I get it, but there was lots of time. Um, in terms of one of the things that came out of the consultation was was just that about, you know, should they, if they're able to, to vote at 16, should they be able to run at 16? And it was unanimous that they all agreed that lowering, and, and while I recognize this being in the Canadian Charter, they all agreed that they were not, they didn't want that right because it would interfere with school and that their job was school. And I'm gonna let you take over from there because there might be some. I, I think one of the challenges would be that an, a legal opinion is a legal opinion and then until there would be a reference case or a law passed that was challenged in court, you wouldn't have the courts defining whether something is constitutional or not. I think if this bill were to pass and there was a constitutional challenge to it, I think realistically the question would be whether that age is just a, the, discre the discrepancy between 16 and 18, the age for voting and the age for running as a candidate is justified, and I imagine if they found that it wasn't justified, you would not see the age for voting go back up to 18, you would see the age to run as a candidate go down if they felt that that was, um, you know, if that restriction at 18 was not reasonable under the charter. Um, but that's a, a, a valid point, and I, I appreciate you um, bringing up the point. But. Yes, the, the reason we focused on the voting age was because I know that's where a lot of the discussion is, hap discussion is happening, and a lot of the literature uh, and the experience globally is really focused on the ability to vote, um, and we haven't seen a whole lot around the ability to stand as a candidate, and that's not to say that they can't stand as a candidate, it's just to say that there is one area where the research is much stronger than the other area, and so we've chosen to focus on the area where that research is is uh, much stronger. And, and and furthering on from that, that's kind of whenever we look at the United Nations Conventions on the right of, Rights of the Child, it's very clear that it that the decisions need to be made based on research. And so there is lots of research about the voting age, but there's not a lot of research on on um, running. And so I can I can see where that would get a bit confusing in the in the charter, but it, there just wouldn't be the the research to back up that change at this point. Cornwall um, Just, I just want further comment, but I, you know, and I, I hear you, but I really feel that we should, if you're going to do this or dive deep into it, that we should get our, our an opinion from a, a charter lawyer. And you know, as as far as, um, you know, all the time. I mean, we've seen things challenged. Uh, we've seen a, a, the Liberal government was challenged on on carbon for the first time ever, and it went to Supreme Court of Canada, and it went on and on, and it, they won, and it was the first time ever. So there was no experience there. There was no experience. So I think that happens, um, and with what you've commented on, on the, uh, the Convention of Rights and Children and all the analytics that are in there, I think you know it, it could be done very easily, but I'm not sure if this Legislative Assembly is getting ahead of itself in regards to that. So I guess until I see or hear that, I'm a little reserved to, to, to go forward with it. That's just me. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, you guys. You're welcome. 
the leader of the third party. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Honourable Member, for bringing this forward. And, and I just have some questions related to my colleague here. Like, you know, is it possible that we could be passing something that, you know, is contrary to Section 3 of the Charter? Now, to your point, you know, 16-year-olds may not want to run because they are, don't want to affect their school. What about the ones that might want to run? And if they challenge it here on PEI, what's going to happen when it comes to the Charter? Like, you know, and, and to my colleague's point, like, maybe we should have more clarity on that. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think the, the member from Cornell Meadowbank, I think, got the right, well, I mentioned the right section, I think, that you need to think about. And the right section would be Section 1 of the Charter, which allows governments to restrict the, the, the rights if they are reasonable and justifiable. Um, and I think that, because the way I would look at this is they do have a charter right. It's to vote. Every Canadian citizen does. And they don't specify, you know, and this right starts at this age. It's, it's left kind of open to interpretation. And so that has been interpreted by the courts. The question is really, is the age that, it's, that, that voting age, your eligibility to vote starts at, is that age reasonable in our society? Um, and so I think really in, in some ways there might be two questions there around is the age to run, um, is that reasonable, and is the age to vote reasonable? Leader of the third party. That's okay for now, thanks. Minister of Economic Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Honourable Member. I know you've put a lot of work into this. Um, so a couple points on, on my... So personally, I certainly support it in, in principle of it. I do feel that a 16-year-old is mature enough to vote. So anytime I hear that they're not mature enough, uh, I don't agree with that, because we could say that with the adults themselves as well. Some adults are probably not mature enough. <laughs> yep. But in saying that, af after this was on the floor last time, I went out, uh, actually I, I followed uh, suit with what the honorable member from uh, uh, Tignish had, had done with, uh, with a post to get people's opinion on. So I knew what my opinion was, and I, I expressed that. And it weighed in, there was probably 60% of people in my district against 40% before, 40% uh, before. Um, but one thing I did find uh, was the 24 hours after, the personal messages I got from people that were against it and the reasons why, and explaining why that they didn't want to post on social media because they didn't want to get, to get beat up for it, uh, which they had valid, valid points. Uh, a lot of them come from parents of these children um, that live with the children, raise them, and, and so forth. So I took that into consideration as well. Like I say, I agree with it, but I don't represent myself. I represent uh, a community and uh, a district and, and Islanders. Um, so that, that's the first point. Se second point, um, for three days now, I've listened to uh, the Minister of Health uh, get beat up on consultation. Uh, we've heard that from that side of the house uh, numerous occasions that consultation wasn't done right. And with all due respect, honorable member, sending an email out is not consultation. And if we were to do that, you would be the first to be all over us on, on that part of it. I'm not against this bill one bit. I certainly would like to see it go forward. Um, but I do think it is a big bill that I want to make sure everybody has, uh, has their input on. Uh, that was the first I heard on the municipal Pality side of it uh, is what Minister Fox said today. So that I wouldn't be privy to that. I've never heard of that. But if we've got 59 mus municipalities that were sent out an email um, and their suggestions went back, but that's how we let, that's not consultation. And we've heard this numerous times what consultation is. And I think we've heard it over the last three days as well. Um, I know in opposition what it's like, and I know the bills we've put, the, the, you feel when you're there that. We're doing everything we can to shut a bill down, and that's certainly not the case. I want to see this bill go through. I, I really do, because I do feel 16-year-olds are mature enough to vote. Uh, but I do think it needs to be done the right way. Um, the last time we had talked about it, the suggestion was to take it to committee. And I believe that you, you pulled the bill to say we were going to have to do consultations. And, and that was over the last few months, which uh, obviously you've been in, in touch with some. Um, but to me, consultation is more than sending a, an email. And uh, I can only speak for myself and how we, we do it through, through the department is we've all, especially with COVID, we've had Zoom calls, uh, we've had people around the table, we've got input, and I've certainly been able to change a lot of the, and obviously from uh, 
from members of the, the House here as well with, with input. So I do apologize not getting back to you because uh, I had no concerns on it. I'm, I'm quite in favour of it. Uh, I just want to make sure we, we do it right. Um, Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbank made a re real good point. Like I don't want to be the laughing stock of the country if we put something through here and uh, we break some constitutional rule of... Uh, so I don't want you to feel that in any way we're trying to shut this down. I just, somehow we need to make sure we get all this out and, and get it done right. And, uh, and once that is there, I'll certainly, uh, certainly make my decision based on that. Thank you. No, um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, one of the things that, that I found a little bit concerning in all of this is a couple of Facebook posts that I saw um, where people were saying, you know, setting it up that they were against it um, and the question was should they be allowed to vote and so I, I'm not sure what the scope of your consultation was um, or what the question was that you asked so I'm not accusing accusing of oh, anything sure. um, but what's really important here is that we've already established that that's not the question that we're asking but rather how does it impact you so I'm not sure what what that that looked like um, in terms of of our own consultation I had um, you know yes it was started as an email but I've had conversations and zoom calls and and chats and all of that stuff so it started as an email that was our first our first reach out point but it, it evolved into much more than that and if you're referring to the emails that I sent to um, to MLAs, uh, I feel like that's a little bit different because I just wanted to make sure that this wasn't seen as partisan, that we were all involved in this, and that was my intent with those emails. Um, and the other thing was, um, there was another point that you made that I was going to touch on. Was there something else that, that you said that I didn't? Anyway, it might come back to me and I'll, I'll come back. Sure. Yeah. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank, thank you, Chair. So, like I said, certainly when I looked at this, I'm, I'm in favour of it in principle, right? I, I certainly feel that a 16-year-old is capable. I know when I was 16, I certainly was, um, and the decisions that are made at that age impact them for the rest of, rest of their lives. So, um, I guess on the consultation, though, and, and I don't want to keep labouring this, right, but out of all the, could, could you just run through who you consulted and how it worked and, and uh, what their feedback was like. If minister didn't ask about the municipalities, when, when you said you met with it, it would have sounded that they were in favor of this, but by the sound of the email you had just read, minister, they are not. And that's concerning, because if we got 59 municipalities that don't think they've been being consulted, it's exactly doing the same thing as what Minister Hudson uh, has been on the house standing for the last three days. We've got organizations that don't feel they've been consulted. And this is where I've got a, a bit of concern, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't want that to come back and say, well, we weren't consulted, it wasn't done right, and, and so forth. But I don't want you to think I'm against this because I'm absolutely not. I'm in favor for it. Uh, I just want to make sure we, we get it right. So if you don't mind, just going through uh, and, and explain the meetings and what took place and what was the feedback from these organizations and their thoughts. Sure. And, and in my opening remarks, I certainly not all of the feedback that we got was positive, but it was all useful. Mm -hmm. So when I said useful, maybe I should have specified a little bit more. Um, so it was funny because the evening that, the first evening that we brought this forward, I went back up to the office afterwards and checked my email and I had a letter. One of the things the Premier had, had kind of said in passing was, you know, it would be nice to have a letter from the PEI Coalition for Women in Government. And when I went back up to my office, that's indeed, um, indeed what I had um, from her and uh, from the, the, uh, the coalition. And uh, the coalition is, um, is very supportive of that. Um, okay, I don't know. How, is that, are you so just kind of may, maybe just a simple? So, I read all that you consulted that okay. are in favor, and then the ones that aren't, and why they're not. I'd like to know why some some of them aren't. Okay, that yeah. So some of them didn't come out and said that they weren't in favor. They just came out with some things to consider. Sure. So that might be yeah. a little bit. But I'll do so. Elections PEI. They were. They were fine with it, um, and the feedback that we heard from them was that gave the, us some considerations and just how it would work and the logistics that. of sure. things. Yeah. Um, student councils from across the province, which oddly enough was a lot like this. We heard a lot of different things, like some thought no because um, they weren't mature enough. Uh, 
it, it's just funny because a lot of the arguments that they used against themselves were the same arguments that we that were heard when we were trying to expend, extend the right for women to vote. And it's things I'm sure a lot of them identified that the way that they were responding was how they heard adults talking about them and they didn't want to make adults mad. So there was very mixed um, in terms of, of, so it wasn't just student councils, but individual youth that we talked to. And, and so it was very mixed from, from our youth, um, but they all said the same thing and that was that our education is not good enough in this area. So that would be kind of something that we'd really need to consider with this bill, because if we were to pass this and just pass that alone, that would be giving a great disservice to our students because we don't teach them that until they're in grade 12, in many cases, kind of up to the individual teacher and, and what their strengths and passions are. Um, and this, and they all kind of suggested, also with a Commission Scolaire Langue Française and the public schools branch, they had said along that line too, it's, it's an opportunity for, um, for parents to be engaged with this because usually after the age of 18 or 17, their children are graduating or, or they're leaving home or whatever. Um, and so, and being under one roof of the school, a really good learning opportunity. One of the biggest concerns that they had were um, around schools becoming um, grounds for campaigns, and they wanted to make sure that you know it didn't open schools up for politicians coming in to, and, and that, uh, absolutely. Um, Young Voters of PEI was very supportive of that and, and offered to um, to do many different things. They wanted to really um, to be a part of it. Coalition for Women in Government, of course. Only way, I can't remember what they said about that. It didn't really be... They I'll have come... not suggested any changes to the legislation at this time. Yeah, they were... They weren't against it, they weren't for it, they just said, let's leave it. Um, Native Council of PEI was, was supportive of it. The Federation of Municipalities had some concerns and wanted us to do, uh, to do a, a study on, um, on what that would look like. Uh, and yeah, they had, um, yeah, so that, that they had some concerns. Uh, the Child and Youth Advocates Office, they were really, uh, they contacted me quite a bit because they were hesitant to come out with a position as they didn't want to be seen as partisan. They're really trying hard to, to uh, maintain their independence. Um, and so, but we did, did meet with them and they shared resources with us. Um, the Child and Youth Advisory Committee of the PEI Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, um, they, were, they were very supportive of it, said the same thing about education. Um, yeah, and then the various youth um, and classrooms, same thing, kind of a mixed bag of, of opinions on that. Chair. Minister of Economic uh, Growth, Tourism and Culture. <coughs> thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honourable Member. Um, so in, in closing, I'm just wondering, um, I'm, and I'm sure it wouldn't be an issue, do you mind tabling all that correspondence so that we can get a better, you'd be okay yeah. with that? Yeah. That's great, thank you. Should we check with them? To make sure yeah. I, I'll check with them first and make sure, sure that's good, sure. but I'm happy to do that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Summerside Wilmot. Hey, Chair. And thank you, Member, for bringing this forward. I appreciate the debate that's happening in the Chamber, and I'm listening with great interest. I think some of the points that have been brought up are interesting, definitely. So one point I, I feel I have to make, Chair, is I hear members saying how important it is that we consult and that uh, meaningful consultation cannot really be summed up as sending an email and then in the same breath say, I've consulted with my district by posting on Facebook. So I'm not sure that we can say one is okay and the other is not okay. And I, I have a comment that I would say, when we are talking about extending the right to vote, extending the franchise to a group of people who don't currently have that right, it's so important that we are asking the correct question. Instead of asking the question, do you, individual who is not impacted by this decision in any way, think that I should give rights to someone who is profoundly impacted? Yes or no? That's, that's sort of the wrong question. And if that's the question we had asked on whether or not we should allow Indigenous Islanders to vote or whether we should allow women to vote, I think we would have found the people who were profoundly unimpacted d had reason to not support the idea of extending that franchise. So when you are consulting with your districts and with your constituents, I would encourage you to ask, how will you be impacted by this decision? And 
I understand that was part of the consultation that you asked, member, when you were going out. And I'm wondering if you could give me a sense of what organizations said would be an impact to them if we extend this franchise so that we can consider and make sure we're mitigating any unnecessary impacts. That's a great question. Um, so uh, the people who have stated that there would be impacts, the Federation of Municipalities. Public schools branch. Public schools branch in terms of the education piece, a commission scolaire langue française, same thing. Um, I think that's it. If there's anything, it's just not in my brain right now. There, I can, there are also some concerns. Groups like, um, and I shouldn't call them concerns, but groups like Young Voters or the Native Council said, you know, if the, the voting age is lowered, then obviously the, the people we'll be delivering services to will lower as well. And so the Native Council, for example, said, oh, we'll want to do more outreach um, with young Indigenous Islanders to ensure they're aware of their rights to vote and ensure that they're able to vote. And young voters similarly would engage in that um, education earlier um, for young people. So those were also some logistical concerns, but not really concerns. I think that would actually be really great to see them working with more Islanders. Thank you, Chair. So that's really interesting. And I think the education component is a really good point because it's not like when our young people turn 18, they suddenly develop this education on the topic. So this sounds like a gap that we are missing anyway. If we are concerned that our 16-year-olds are not informed enough on civics education, then we're failing our 18-year-olds when they vote, and we're failing our 20-year-olds when they vote, because there actually isn't another opportunity to engage them. I, I don't know if the oh, Minister of Education... Yeah, or has been called. Two minutes early. I have four fifty eight my phone. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry? Chair of the Committee of the Whole House to have another consideration of building the Individual Election Age Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sean Carey. The Honourable Member from Morale Dona and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown Winslow that this House adjourn until Friday, March 26th at 10 o'clock in the a.m. Shut up, Carrie. Carrie. Carrie.